hello, hello, Danger Noodles. It is I, uh, the gr uh, great Dr. Bright here with, uh, with friends. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> You don't even remember our names. We're just friends. <laughs> that was the joke. Anyway. You're really, you're, you're really letting those three hundred followers get to your head. Shut the fuck up, zero seven nine. Yeah. Also, um, I have good news and bad news. Which do you want to hear? Uh, I want to tell you in good news first. Uh, I was able to eat today with a free meal from McDonald's. Bad news is I got food poisoned and didn't eat the rest of the day. Are you what? Again? <laughs> yes. They they dumped way too much grease into it, and I didn't pay attention, and uh, and as well as salt, and I got sick. Oh well, that's not food poisoning. That's just oh. your your issues. Yeah, food think... poisoning is when there's like an explicit like yeah foreign bacteria in it yeah. that causes Although, harm. It is true that if there's too much fat and too much salt, it will make you sick anyway. But yeah. Which is technically right in that it's technically not food poisoning. It's just my fucked up stomach. <laughs> no, no. It's it's the food. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Probably a little bit of food. Yeah. But, um, so yeah, I, ha I at least ate once today. <laughs> uh. <laughs> Fun. Anyways, uh, First story of tonight, um, with a, a rating of 5.43 out of 10, uh, Werewolf Ears, <laughs> written, okay. written by uh, Colpick. I am ready for the most mediocre horror story I have ever heard in my life. I'm ready for my Cole to get picked at. That was a bad joke, I know. <laughs> Anyways. Time for the reading. <clears throat> Did you hear about Sev? Jimmy lifted his eyes from his work, looked at George's reflection, and replied, Sal, no, what's up with him? Probably spent more time hovering over people, talking to the reflections in a, in a large mirror on the wall than he did conversing with them face to face. This unique perspective of people in his profession never failed to make him feel more like a fly on the wall than an actual participant in a conversation. Jimmy looked at people at people like he did puzzle pieces sure most of them seem the same or quite similar but if you picked one piece out of the pile you could see its own unique shape it amazed him how all these singular pieces somehow managed to fit together sure every now and again you'd have a piece that needed to be pressed into place with a little more force than the others or a piece that went missing but no picture was perfect all the one-on-one -on -one conversations he had with most of the male inhabitants in town over the past 40 odd years made him feel like a kind of counselor or advisor to the town oh you haven't had sal's in the hospital some sort of coma george hopped his enthusiasm for delivering this juicy bit of gossip didn't come off as uncaring. Coma? He was just in here last week. He mowed his scissors and looked right at George's reflection with a stunned look on his face. Come to think of it, 
who said he had a doctor's appointment later that day. He wasn't looking too good either. Yeah, according to Sue, the doctors don't know what's wrong with him. He just collapsed last night while playing bingo at the church. Oh, and get this, Carl's son's Kevin, the one with the, with the exterminator business, disappeared the other day. Nobody's seen seen hide nor hair of him in, in a few days. Jimmy stood there thinking about his conversation with Sal the other day. Hmm, that seems normal enough to me. Doesn't Kevin have a girlfriend who lives out of town? He's probably just shacked up with her. He does, but he missed appointments, and nobody has heard from him. Answered George, with an air of certainty. He loved to be the guy with all the answers. Jimmy scratched his head. You know, now that I think about it, Sal mentioned having Kevin spray his attic last week. He said he had some sort of, of infestation up there. Yet this, according to him, his entire attic was covered in some sort of webbing. And it was all squirming with what looked like thin, short strands of string. George turned his head to look at Jimmy, his expression a big question mark. What, like silkworms? I never heard of infestation like that before. Jimmy spun George around in, a, in the barber chair and looked straight at him. Me nada. That's what he said. Wow, white strands hanging from webs. It was a strange, it was strange the other day. So comes in here for a haircut every two weeks like clockwork. I don't recall him ever going longer than two weeks without one, but when he came in here the last time, he looked like he hadn't been in the shop in a couple of months. His hair was a lot longer than it should have been, and it was stark white. George didn't seem too impressed. Eh. He's an old white hair. Has been for, for years. No, his hair used to be gray. There's a difference, trust me. I notice these things. Who else but me knows about that dent on the back of your head? George defenselessly reached back around the back of his head. Okay, okay, you're the expert, but... And another thing, Jimmy said, cutting George off. He had the wildest werewolf ears I've ever seen. George puzzled expression beckoned Jimmy to elaborate. Oh, it's something my father used to say to customers with hair in or on their ears. Sal never had much ear hair before, but the other day his ears were a damn jungle. Jimmy decided not to mention that he thought he had seen some of the werewolf hairs twitching when he was sweeping them up later on. He had blamed it on drinking two more cups of coffee than usual that day. George settled back in, in his chair. Well, it seems to me like we're carrying on three different conversations here. I don't see what any of this has to do with Sal being in the hospital. I'm gonna go check in on him later when I pick up Sue from there. Jimmy absentmindedly brushed a white hair off his arm, spun George back around and returned to the task hand. Jimmy didn't have another conversation after George left. He had plenty of boring days like today, waiting for people to drag themselves into the barber shop for a haircut, which is part of the job. He tossed back three aspirin and washed them down with a swig of old burnt coffee. He decided to go see Sal if he could just get his headache to subside a bit. He's been feeling it slowly ramping up all day, and now it's making it hard to think straight. That's it, he said aloud to the empty shop. He was tired and just wanted to go home and sleep off whatever he was coming down with. He shut off the lights, grabbed his coat, and locked up. As he stepped out of sight of the front display window, something about the size of a child's fist slipped down from the ceiling on a thin strand of filament. It landed on a counter littered with the tools of the barber trade and swiftly headed towards the back room. 
I came across a stray white hair attached to it attached to it to a strand of silk hanging from its spinneret and it dragged it along behind it as it crawled down the counter to the floor and entered the back room it approached a garbage bag laying in front of the back door easily slit the plastic bag of hair open and began to emit a shrill sound reminiscent of a whistling kettle Slowly, over the next several minutes, little white hair slipped out of the bag and slinked towards the source of the noise. It then attached them one by one to the ever-lengthening strand of silk trailing behind it. It crawled back to the place in the ceiling it originally came through with its collection of twitching white things in tow and slipped out of sight. The Latin silk strand quickly followed and vanished into the ceiling as well. A cargo van ha was haphazardly parked about 10 feet off an old dirt road in the middle of the forest. Its sides were em emblazoned with the identical logos that read K PAL Extermination. A pale skinned man sat stiffly in the front seat. The top of his skull was ripped open like the top of a pan of Jiffy Pop. Chubby white worms en engorged with brain matter squirmed inside the man's exposed skull. They wriggled here and there all over his lap, lap in the front seats of the van. A spider about the size of a basketball bat ba basketball sat in the passenger seat. Its silverly sheen gave off Gave it an almost mechanical appearance. It had a worm. God damn it! It had a worm pinned to the seat by its pedipalps. Emaciated, emaciated little husk of worms lay all around it. The back seat was covered in a glistening, almost translucent pattern of silk. Little white strands were woven into a pattern like some sort of twitching tapestry. And yeah, and that's it of the story. Wait. Wait, what? Yeah, that's it. I see why I got the low rating. I... <laughs> <laughs> that felt more like a fever dream than a proper story. I literally... Agree. Literally, the... No, this is lowest rating book one. Yeah, that was five out of ten. Yeah. I, Almost five out of ten. Yeah, I'm just... Literally, the only remarkable thing is the fact that they used an anatomical part of spiders correctly. Pedipalps. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> that's the most. That's 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 the most impressive thing about that story. They described a spider somewhat reasonably. Yeah. Why did we read that? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> well, Bright didn't know the end, just like we didn't. Who knew that it was a it was. Put as a creepy story, but it's actually someone going in a room to find a thing, and then it's over. It's just like, like, uh, no calling the cops, no, not nothing else. That's it. It's just oh, oh, there's there's a corpse there, with <laughs> with with a spider. Spiders pinning a worm. The end. Yeah. I like how in one of the tags for the story, it, it's it says twist endings. As a tag. Twi what? How is that That's... a twist? <laughs> <laughs> okay, if I was going to guess. My my piecing together of what's going on in that story is you have the two people 
in the barber shop that are just chatting and they're talking about how it's it's weird this one person had like had, had issues and then it's like turning out that the barber was it, it knew about what was happening and was somehow facilitating the the the, the worm eating spider creatures in his back room so i guess like he could say it's a twist because the barber that's been narrating all of this is just like like he's he's behind some of it yeah but it'd be more accurate to say that this was just a massive waste of time yeah i also decided to see if this person wrote any other stories this is their only story oh uh, you know like I can I can appreciate the fact that it's probably hard to write a story, and they're not a professional, but my I am exceptionally unimpressed. I don't blame you. All right, for the next one. I'm gonna put it to a vote of you. Uh, I, I mean, if if Bookworm, Hatchet, and Jiri, I'm gonna choose. I chose three stories out of the list I have. Turkey Molar, with a reading time of 14 minutes. Uh, my father punished me when I talked to Ghost, reading time of eight minutes. And the kitchen drawer. With a reading time of 12 minutes. I think on average we should be doubling those reading times because it's yeah. being read aloud and it's being read by Dwight. Fuck you. I mean, I'm just stating I'm just stating an empirical fact. You like when especially when reading out loud, you you read slowly. This is not a bad thing. It's just reality. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I could mock you if you want me. Do you want me to mock you? No. I can't do that. No. Okay. So, Hatchet, oh, no, no. what is your vote? Um, I'm gonna go with, uh, my dad punishes me when I talk to ghosts. Alright, Jiri? My dad punishes me when I talk to ghosts. Oh, wow. Just like even if Bookworm has a vote, I don't think it's going to matter. <laughs> hey, Bookworm, are you going to be a contrarian, or are you going to be a a, a, a fallen line? <laughs> now we're right on book. Oh wow, I'm going to have to do um an immediate <laughs> uh content warning for this story. I just oh. looked at the tags. Dear god. <laughs> it has like a 9.14 out of 10 rating, so it's well liked. Is book still here or Jesus. Bookworm, if you're still here, give us a sign. How gay is you? Hey! How Jiri is the gay? I'm not the gay. I am gay, but I'm not the gay. You're there lord... are other gays. You're a lord of gay. A lord of gay? Yes. That sounds similar to the Lord of the Dance, only instead of dancing, I just have rainbows floating around me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, no, instead of rainbows, it's just men. <laughs> I don't have men floating around <laughs> <laughs> And you knew the gay lord by their crown. It was nothing but men. <laughs> Yeah. 
Is it like, was it carving men? Like, on the crown? No, they just wore men. I mean, I'd rather be sitting on top of a pile of men, but... <laughs> I mean... I mean, oh, I can't... I can't come back from that, can I? No. <laughs> you will know uh... the gay lord for the pile of men. <laughs> Yeah. Also, I looked at Tangia while waiting for Bookworm to respond. Um, they recently added Danny DeVito text to speech. Cool. I like Danny DeVito. I think. I think Bookworm stepped away. Guy. So I don't think Bookworm probably stepped away. Fair. Therefore, we shall assume that Bookworm was a contrarian, and I shall be sending someone to collect his needs. <laughs> Alright, I guess I'll read the story. All right. My father punished me when I talked the ghost. Written hey, by... Hey. What? Hey, Bright. What? Didn't she say you needed to do a content warning? Oh, right. Yeah. Uh... God, you fucking dead shit. <laughs> yeah, Alright. <laughs> Due to that I read some of the tags, uh, this is a content warning, uh, there are two tags in here that say Adductions and Kidnappings is one tag, and Child Abuse is the other tag. Rip. So yeah, this is definitely a content warning, if you don't want to hear a story about that, you might want to click off right now. <laughs> uh... Anyways. You good, Judy? Yeah, you good? Yeah, it's just, you almost forgot that. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Anyways. My father punished me when I talked to Ghost. Written by Edwin Crow. I have been blind since birth. As I grew up, everything was described to me in such a vivid detail that I don't even realize why it was that important to see. Especially having no reference point to compare it. He lived in a single floor ranch house. That's what my father told me. In my mind, of course, I could see, although unlike how a sighted, sighted person could, I had spatial awareness. I knew where my bedroom was, where the bathroom, living room, and kitchen were. Each wall had its own texture. I don't know if that was done on purpose, or if I could feel things others never noticed. I rarely fell over, only if father or one of the visitors put something somewhere they shouldn't have. It was usually the visitors and father would shout. They visited infrequently, and only briefly when they did. Father said I shouldn't speak to them. That it unsettled him. He'd worry when I saw something he didn't. Saw it with my ears or by touch. Ellie was, fir was the first. She seemed very sweet. She asked me my name and why my face was so messed up. She was in the living room. I could hear where she sat from her breaths. Harsh nasal sounds as if her nose was blocked. When father had a cold, he'd always, he'd always breathe through his mouth, big, labored breath, as he wasn't used to it. When people mentioned my face, I always touched it, trying to work out why it was so strange to them, why I asked if I could touch theirs. There was always a pause. I guess sighted people never did that. Why would they need to? When I asked Ellie if I could touch her face, she reluctantly agreed, but moments later, Father entered the room and asked me who I was speaking to. I told him, nobody. He would always punish me when I spoke about them. I think it scared him. He'd take my arm and march me off. I'd be knocked off balance and disoriented, to the point where when he finally set me down, my hands would would frantically search my surroundings until I knew where I was. 
It was usually my bedroom, though every now and then he'd leave me outside in the middle of nowhere. That was the worst. I would be lost and scared. He told me about the road that ran in front of the house and explained that the sounds I heard were cars, that they'd kill me if they touched me. Those sounds were my only means of recognizing my surroundings. I waited until I heard one and then knew which way to run back to the house. I heard Ellie that evening. She whispered to me, saying she was scared. I whispered back, but she didn't hear. I asked father about Ellie. He didn't want to talk about her. I asked him why. He didn't reply. When I told him that she asked about my face, he asked how he asked me how I responded. I told him I wanted to touch hers. He laughed, though I knew he wasn't happy. I could hear the difference. When you laugh for pleasure, your mouth is wide open. When you pretend, your mouth is almost closed. To me, the difference is obvious. It wasn't until I was older that he explained. He said he, we lived in a special place, connected to the other world, that sometimes dead people slip through, people who died in pain and wanted to reach the living. He explained that because I couldn't see, I was able to tune in to that. They knew I was listening when others weren't. He said I had to ignore it. Otherwise, he told me they'd latch on and never leave me. All the dead won't want is to be alive again, he said. It was dangerous, and they would trick me. He said he knew how to deal with them, but he couldn't help if they come attached to me. Alex appeared to me a few years later. She told me she was lost and didn't know where she was. I told her I wasn't allowed to speak to her. Still, she pleaded for help. I kept quiet, knowing what would happen if I said anything. Did you speak to them? Father asked. Though I was upset, I told him no. I wish I could help her. I knew what it was like to be lost, and it scared me. Alex didn't whisper to me at all. I'd ignored her, and she ignored me. Father saved me, and I was thankful. After Alex, I knew what I needed to do, so I did it. The spirit stopped bothering me after that. For a very long time, that was until Sarah appeared. Sarah didn't give me a chance to be quiet. I was on my own, sitting in the living room and listening to the television. Help, she said. I need to find a way out. I stayed silent. You can hear me, can't you? She asked, surprised. I'm not allowed to speak to you, I told her. Please, she begged. I'm scared. I'm lost. I want to see my daddy. I gripped the arms of the chair and told her I wasn't allowed. He's dead, she said. I didn't answer. Your father is dead. He said again. I wasn't going to fall for it. I heard banging from around the room as things began to fly and shells began to shake. Stop it! I shouted, and it did. Please help me leave, she said. I wasn't going to talk to her. I did the only thing I thought would help. I unlocked the front door, hoping she'd run out and get lost, just like I would do. When I heard from her no more, I locked the door and sat back down. I listened intently for any signs she was still there, except for the sounds of the TV. It was silent. I hated when my heart raced. I became too aware of the tick-tock feeling of the rise and fall within my chest, like it was about to explode. When I heard my father's voice, I screamed. Son, he said. 
I need your help. I think I'm dying. I did what he told me to do. I didn't speak. If he did die, he'd never leave me. Instead, I raced out into the open air and shouted for help. I shouted until my voice was hoarse. I heard the sounds of cars racing along the road in front of my house. I shouted until I heard someone respond. It was a woman. What's wrong? They asked. I told them I think my father was dying. They asked what happened to my face. I pleaded with them to help me, and they promised they would. I sat down on the grass and waited. Some time later, the woman returned to me and asked if she could hold my hand. I am so sorry, she told me. I heard the sounds of sirens and a lot of people rushing. I asked what was going on. The woman said she was there for me. As the noise died down, a man asked me a question. I'm a paramedic, he said. What happened to your face? I told him I was fine. He asked if I was sure, and I told him I was. He asked if I minded him touching my face. I said it was okay. A month later, I felt a pressure release from around my forehead, and the air felt cold against my skin. It sounded as if he was peeling an orange. I managed imagined that in my head and where he exposed my insides. I screamed and asked what he was doing. He told me everything was going to be okay, and the woman squeezed my hand, telling me to be brave. I didn't know what I was experiencing. I felt a tight pain within my head, like when you smash your skin against something hard, followed by something I've come to understand as bright. It hurt so much, I began to cry. What happened to your eyes? The paramedic asked. I said I was blind. He asked to check them. The pain returned when he examined them. Do you know him? The, the man asked the woman who had helped me. She told him that I had been screaming for help and that she had come to my aid, but that she had never met me before. How long have you had your eye injury? He asked me. I told him I've been blind from birth. He asked me if I could see his fingers. I told him no. He asked if I could open my eyes. I said I didn't know what he meant. He asked if I could op if he could open them for me. I didn't respond. Then I felt his fingers on my face. Fingers co covered in something rubbery. Suddenly, it became bright again. I screamed. He tried to call me. No one squeezed my hand again. I didn't know what was happening. Things I couldn't describe came to me. It was like it always was, but multiplied 100 fold and so much more real. I carried on screaming as the fuzzy form came into view. Just breathe, okay? The paramedic said. Everything will be fine. When was the last time you saw? As my heart began to calm and with my breathing slowed, being distracted by what I was experiencing, it overwhelmed me, I wanted to cry, and I did. How long has it been? He asked again. I have never seen anything before, I told him. I was told to keep an eye mask on for most of the day, only taking it off at night at first to allow my eyes time to adjust. At the same time, I was placed in the custody of my aunt and uncle and didn't even know it at first. They were shocked at what happened to me and that I had never attended school. The past few years have been a roller coaster ride. The doctor said I may never have perfect vision, but what little I have is a godsend and I'll take what I can get. I've only recently been learning to read and write, so I apologize if my English isn't the greatest. It's the best I can do. I've been asking my aunt what happened to my father, and all she says is that he died of a heart attack. I asked him what sort of man he was. She said she was her brother, and she'll love him no matter what. 
Ankle doesn't want to talk about him at all. I'm using the computer a lot recently and really enjoying the internet. I can't believe such a thing exists. After being so lonely for so long, I can talk to whoever I want, when I want, though I'm wary of that. After all, how do I know if who I'm speaking to is a lie? No one seems to share my father's concerns about that. Today, I was on a forum discussing the spirit world. I was so happy to find people who I could relate to, and someone curious about my username sent me a link to an article on a true crime website. It was about my father and mentioned me by name. He asked me who I was and if I was the same person. According to the article, my mother had gone missing soon after my birth. I said I had been found so that I could see my, that my father always wanted a daughter. They found 14 bodies in the basement. He said one got away, a girl by the name of Sarah Frank. She was the one to call the police. They found my father's car parked around the back of the house. They supposed they supposed he carried his victims to, into the basement via the storm entrance and left them there. Sarah had managed to get away after she agreed to be his daughter following four days of sustained torture. She stabbed him with a knife he placed on the counter to butter some toast. I didn't want to believe it, and I'm not sure I would have if it weren't for the names of the victims, two of which stuck out. Ellie Farmer and Alex Riddle. I had spoken to them both in the living room. To this day, I wonder if my father had been honest with me about a single thing in his life. Throughout it all, one question remains above all others. Did I speak to Ellie and Alex before or after he killed them? And that's it. Yeah, I realized that I had picked that book not long after I started reading, like, oh, this is the opposite of the first story. Yeah. I shouldn't say it like that, but... I mean, that was pretty good. What would have been worse, talking to them while they were still alive or talking to their ghost? So, so that was a bit of a mind fuck. <laughs> <laughs> Did you like it? Well, it, it's still a question. Do you think he spoke to them when they were alive or dead? Who knows? I don't fuck if I know. <laughs> there are some hints in the story that he was speaking to them while they were alive, but he didn't I realize didn't... it. I I was getting that feeling as well. Honestly, I feel like it could have been like early on in the story. I thought I feel like this would have been much better if it wasn't titled the way it was. If it was just like reworded to instead of ghosts, it's like the visitors. Yeah. Because I feel like that would have helped create a bigger ambiguity between whether or not these were actual people and ghosts. Yeah. And so that, like, when we get, like, throughout the rest of the story and it's talking about the shit that his father did, it, like, I don't know. Like, nah. It was good. I, I liked it quite a bit. Mm -hmm. I think I want to choose the next story. Okay. Also, what's up? 
What's up with the porn in the background? What porn? I was hearing like, like. Oh, horn! Yeah, I, I thought Hedge just said porn. porn as well. <laughs> no, I. No. <laughs> I was like, wait a minute, what? <laughs> the horn is just food. Food is weird. They've listened to weirder things. Food is a horn. Food is listening to horn. Well, was no, I don't know what they're listening to. Hmm. Food looks at weird things. Food listens to weird things. All right. The next story that I'm choosing is the kitchen drawer. Let me check to make sure. And nope, there's no tags that say that's like the last one. I gotta check before I read. That's a good thing to do. Yeah. Anyways, we ready? I'm assuming yes. <laughs> yes. Jeez, what the fuck? <laughs> Alright. Hey, I'm good. Okay. The Kitchen Drawer, written by John Douglas Rainey. Dear Thomas, know this. I love you, brother. I'm not sure what you will find waiting for you on the kitchen counter besides this notebook. Hopefully, nothing. But it wouldn't hurt to check the floor to make sure a finger or two hasn't rolled under the counter. You and I just hung up the phone, and you're on your way here. This gives me enough time to write this letter and finish what I had started. I want you to understand that I only threatened to burn this place down with me and cite it to force you to come. It was the only way I could get you to leave the city and drive to the farmhouse. You wouldn't have thought I was mad if I told you over the phone that I solved the mystery as to why no one has ever found Mom's body. The answer lies within the kitchen drawer. Of course, I'd be gone too by the time you get here. I'd say goodbye in person, but for me, I accept my current physical state as a steady process of my own doing over the past 24 hours. For you, seeing me, or should I say, what's left of me, would be a frightful shock. As you know, Carol and the kids moved in with her new boyfriend last year. What you don't know is that my life has spiraled downward ever since. Or maybe it started long before her affair did. She says, she says I drove her and the kids away probably true. The ones closest to always seen us crashing long before we even realized were in the tailspin. Not long after they left, I lost my job. Stopped paying my bills, stopped socializing, regrettably even with you. I stopped everything. Well, not everything. The bottle has, be has become my companion. I guess I'm more like dad than I ever wanted to be. So of course, I was drinking when Carol showed up at my apartment and demanded that I sign the divorce papers. That didn't go well at all. Bottle made sure of that. So I fled and came here. As far as I can tell, no one has been inside since we were removed in the place in the boys' home. Sad to think that this house never got a second chance at having a happy family. As bleak as our childhood was, I still pictured our home in the fair condition. Mom kept it during our youth, so when I arrived here two days ago, I was dismayed to see how decrepit it had become. Weather damage and the corrosion of time had plagued the roof and wooden frame, making it look sickly. In fact, the surrounding neighborhood looks bad, as if the atrocities spread from our house and, inf and infected the whole town. And as you can see, the inside is worse. 
no electricity, no water, filth, mold, and the stench of abandonment pollutes the air. The wooden floors are rotted, the painted walls are chipped, and the wallpapered ones are peeling. I didn't look around much since there isn't a lot I want to reminisce about. No, drunk as I was, my purpose was unclouded. I entered the kitchen, littered with rat turds and cobwebs, and was almost disappointed to find the outside of the kitchen drawer, decayed with its steel handle rusted. However, I did get a sh the shock I was expecting when I opened the drawer. Empty, clean, unchanged with time. Look for yourself, Thomas. But I warn you, do not put anything in the drawer. Not yet. With great curiosity, I examined the drawer. First, I tried to take it out by sliding it along its tracks. But the drawer does not want to come out. Then, I felt along the inside of the cabinet, and, with, and every inch of it was sturdy and smooth. It looked clo I looked closely at the metal wheels and, s and the slides and found them shiny and unscathed. So it makes no sense that the drawer is irremovable and even more illogical that it should be in such condition, great condition after two decades of neglect. Then again, as you might recall, this drawer does have a history. Mom would always complain that the cabinet was too darn big to keep important papers in. Nevertheless, it became the one place in the house where she would, she and Dad put all kinds of stuff. And it was Mom who used to say that the drawer ate the stuffing. Bills, letters, pens, and, and pencils. Whatever Dad was fierce about a bill or anything with pertinent information getting lost, Mom would swear that she put it in the drawer and now it's gone. Dad would beat her. Later on, she would tell us that the drawer ate whatever she got punished for losing. We'd agreed, but how awful it must have been for Mom to feel patronized by her own children oh, while nursing black eyes and swollen lips. Heard in your heart, dear brother, for you must read the words you have never permitted me to speak in person. In respecting your wishes, I have kept the dark secret that not even Carol, nor the police who interrogated us that night are pri privy to. For on the night that Dad killed Mom, I saw the drawer eat something. Dad and the bottle were, were hanging out all day when someone came to the farmhouse and gave him an envelope. You and Mom were upstairs. The man drove away and dad opened the envelope right in front of me since we were always poor my eyes must have opened as wide as dad's at the sight of all that, that cash it was the first time i saw two things one hundred dollar bills and dad's smile he was jubilant as he counted five thousand dollars out loud keep in mind this wasn't a shared moment between us i was a witness he was too drunk to see me sitting at the at the corner of the table, doing my homework. I watched him tuck the cash back inside the envelope and go over to the kitchen cabinet. He opened the drawer and put it inside and closed it. Then he went back to the living room to share the news with the bottle and call someone on the house phone. Mom came downstairs and started doing dishes. I swear to you, brother, she did not open that drawer, but when Dad hung up the phone and returned to the kitchen, the first thing he did was open it. His face said it all. The rage was like a switch that had been flipped on. Dad threw everything out of the drawer until there was nothing left. He accused her of stealing his money. She didn't have a clue as to what he was talking about. That didn't stop him from hurting her. Eventually, Dad noticed me. I suffered a few blows as I was forced to deny stealing his money. He sent me up to my room and there I stayed like a coward as mom fought to her last breath. I always admired you for sneaking out of your bedroom window, going to the neighbors and calling the police. I'm glad dad got caught, literally red handed, blood all over himself. 
on the saw he used to presumably dismember her and blood all over the kitchen. Everywhere except inside the kitchen drawer. Cobb said it was as if Dad had a plastic bag in that drawer that he kept putting body parts in. But they never determined where the body parts went from there. Mom was gone. Every single part of her. Only the stain of the crime remained, which is sadly ironic, that she hated a messy kitchen. Mom would have cringed at the at the notion of one day being reduced to a blood stain. Dad was drunk during his confession, but it was still admissible in court when he told the officers on scene that he killed his wife in a fit of rage. He never admitted to dismembering her, despite all the blood evidence. Her body, bloody clothes were found on the kitchen floor when asked how he disposed of her body. From his original confession to his dying words in a prison hospital, he always gave the same response. You wouldn't believe me if I told you. Yesterday, I woke up on the rotten kitchen floor, having passed out drunk on my first night back. In 26 years, I immediately went out and got another bottle, just like Dad. I came back here to the scene of the crime, and the bottle, and I opened up our souls. Why didn't I try to save Mom? Did Dad do what I think he did with her body? Does the drawer really eat stuffing? Bills, letters, pens, and pencils, flesh, bones, organs, and hair. After going mad with questions, the bottle and I conducted an experiment. I took a pair of scissors I found, a rock from outside, and my vehicle registration from the car, and I put all three items in the drawer. I closed it for a mere second before yanking the drawer back open. Paper, scissors, no rock. Dumbfounded, I examined the drawer. Then I closed the cabinet and opened it again. Scissors, no paper. I closed and opened it, opened it a third time. Empty. Not to sound insensitive, given the subject matter, but I was excited because I proved Mom right. The drawer does eat stuffing. It eats when it chews by being opened and closed. If you have more than one thing in there, when you open and close that drawer, something's going to get chewed up. If there is only one item inside, then that item will be eaten. That's why the police never found Mom's body, because Dad cut her up into pieces and helped the drawer chew her up. Sorry to be so crude. I bet it all started as cruel revenge. Him sticking a part of her in the drawer. He must have been shocked that the part disappeared. Then maybe he put a second piece of her inside out of stubborn disbelief. When it happened again, I gather he saw it as a means to hide the evidence of his crime. So Mom became stuffing. The drawer eats whatever you feed it, even if it's something dead. Call it supernatural, call it divine, call the drawer whatever you want, but it is a living thing. The magnitude of its extraordinary realization gave me a strange rush. I merely smiled for a moment like Dad did when he saw that cash. And just like Dad, my moose quickly soured when I heard banging at the front door and the sound of Carol yelling. As I confess, bear in mind, brother, that I have been drinking all day and Carol has become the person I hate most in the world. Post Dad's death to liver cancer. So, when she tracked me down, to our childhood home and barged inside. I felt like a trapped animal under attack. She stormed in the kitchen and demanded that I sign the divorce papers she had in hand. Well, it is here what I wholeheartedly admit to feeling a surge of alcohol-fueled rage course through my veins as I wanted to stuff those divorce papers in the drawer, close it, and make the room for more stuffing. Filled with anger, I moved toward her, and then it caught the corner of my eye from across the room. I turned to look and saw it clearly from the sunlight piercing through the dirty window. A blood stain on the counter, 
a mom stain. Mom. I hugged Carol, signed the divorce papers, and I asked her to tell the kids that I loved them. She left confused but gratified. I have never succumbed to violence and I never will. I guess I'm not like that after all. It made me realize that I probably didn't need to, to drink like Dad did either. Invigorated, I grabbed the bottle and headed for the drawer. I slammed the bottle inside and shut it. I was drunk, mind you, as my forefingers were inside the drawer. When it closed, I felt a tap. Nothing more. I opened it. The drawer ate one of my fingers. The bottle was there. I still had three of my four digits, but my middle finger was gone. There was no pain. The skin over the nub was smooth, as if my finger had been removed surgically and healed over. The reason I didn't freak out was because I was pissed off about it. I wanted my finger back, and I was drunk, so I did something stupid. I removed the bottle and stuck my whole hand inside. I shut the drawer on my hand with the desire to open it and have my finger reattached. The slight tap near the base of my thumb was subtle but proved significant as the drawer considered my palm, thumb, and three remaining fingers as one stuffing. My hand was gone at the wrist. I stared in disbelief at the nub at the end of my arm. There wasn't any pain, but I'm pretty sure I was in shock as I shoved my arm inside the drawer and yelled for it to replace my hand right now. I drunkenly slammed the drawer closed on my arm and then stood up. Yes, the drawer ate my arm. I used my other hand to feel the nub at my shoulder blade where my arm used to be connected. I remember I remember laughing and feeling dizzy, and then for a second time since I arrived, I passed out on the kitchen floor. When I awoke, there was a strange sensation that was with my missing limb. I could feel all my fingers attached to my hand, which felt reattached to my arm. I'm not talking about phantom limbs. I'm saying that whatever my, wherever my arm was, it was whole again. I could touch my missing fingers together. I could snap with my thumb and middle finger, which was the first part of me to go. And now it's back in place. I felt my missing hand crawl around a strange floor. Then I bent my arm at the elbow and felt the the nub above my armpit, where my arm ends. The drawer eats whatever you feed it, even if it's something alive. My re revelation inclines me to believe that the drawer doesn't care whether you're dead or alive, or in pieces. The end result is that it puts you together again, whole on the other side. Wherever that is, it begs further questions. Did mom get reconnected? piece by piece, and if so, maybe she got put back together alive. Well, dear brother, that is what I tend to find out. First, I retrieved this notebook and a pen from my car and sat down on the kitchen counter. Then I called you on my cell and turned my phone off. As I wrote all of this, you should be here shortly, as I have no reason to think you're not coming to try and save me from torching this place with me inside it. You always were the heroic one. Now it's time for me to go, one piece at a time. After all, some of me is already there. What, wherever there is, the rest of me is catching up. That's all. While seated on the, on the computer, I stuck one foot inside the drawer and closed it. I felt a mere tap and nothing more, lifted my leg up and stared at the ankle nub where my foot used to be. I wriggled my missing toes and could feel them moving around somewhere, waiting for me. To say it's been challenging would be an understatement, but I've managed to maneuver around well enough to help the drawer eat me. After I fed it my other foot, I stuffed my legs in the drawer one at a time until my legs were gone from the knees down. Then I kind of, kind of slid down into the drawer, up to my belly button, used my only remaining hand to pull myself, and the drawer closed. 
I felt a pat on my lower body, and then suddenly I was falling. Thankfully, my hand caught the edge of the sink, and I was able to pull myself back up onto the counter. I am half a man, from stomach to head, with but one arm to finish this letter, and lower myself down into the drawer. When then I will stuff myself inside and pull the cabinet closed, reuniting with the rest of me. Again, may I remind you to check the four fingers in case I lose one closed in the drawer, and if so, be a sport and toss, toss them in one at a time. I'd hate to be incomplete wherever I'm going. If I'm right and mom is there, I will tell her you love her. Who knows? You might even decide to come join us, Arthur. You, uh, it's not over yet. Oh. Dear Arthur, thank you for writing this letter. I'm sorry that your final attempt didn't go as successfully as you certainly hoped. Your hand is crawling around the floor when I entered the kitchen. I screamed and stomped on your hand several times. Sorry about that. I hope it didn't hurt you too bad, wherever you are. I wonder if you're consciously controlling your hand when it grabbed hold of my shoe, or was it, or was it instinctively grasping at me in survival mode? Either way, I threw your creepy hand in the drawer of all places. It's as if the drawer wants us to feed it, no? Maybe it does have influence over this place and us. I closed the drawer and found this notebook lying on the counter, and after reading it, I summoned the courage to open the drawer again. I hope your hand found you well, my brother, and that you are whole, since you confided in me. Allow me to share with you a secret I too have kept all these years, one of the heroics you mentioned when I ran to the neighbors. I didn't go out my window, I snuck out the back door, but first... I crept to the kitchen doorway and saw Dad stuffing Mom inside the drawer, piece by piece. That's why I've never been able to discuss that day, regrettably, not even with you. And for the rest of my life, I, s I have suffered nightmares of seeing Mom in some strange place where she has been put back together again, piece by piece, except her attached head and limbs are bloody and crooked. She is whole, but not alive, as she reaches for me. I wake up screaming in my bed. I still do, and I pray that if you do, did find Mom whole, she is the version you hoped for, and not the one that haunts me. Last night, I had another nightmare. Mom was in that strange place, but for the first time, you were standing beside her on crooked legs, both of you whole, but in pieces. Not alive, but still reaching for me. My apologizing, my, my apologies for sharing such a morbid vision, but I hope it explains why I dare not attempt to join you. After I feed this notebook to the drawer, I'm going to burn this place to the crown. Call it mystical, call it magical. I don't care what you call this living abomination, because this letter is the last thing that it's ever going to eat. I hope the drawer chokes on it. Goodbye, brother, and know this. I love you too. Thomas. And that's it. That's that's a valid response. Fuck this drawer, fuck your want to, you know, go in here. That is nightmare fuel. You are crazy. I love you, goodbye forever. <laughs> I burn Nightmare House. Nightmare House, go bye bye. So the real horror was lack of communication between the brothers. <laughs> <laughs> that's what Pokemon said. That's, that's actually true. Also trauma. Yeah. Trauma <laughs> and lack of communication, yes. Why is that? And even in real life, that seems to be the root cause of a lot of issues. Yeah. Honestly, yeah, like, that's a pretty consistent thing that, like, I kind of marvel at. For a species that got to the top of the food chain and has all of this shit now, because we were so good at working with each other, 
we really suck at socializing. Yeah. Like it, it my like my first thing is thinking of the fact that like there's been some studies that actually came to the conclusion that the average person is like fifty percent uh like like can only tell if they're being flirted with by another person fifty percent of the time or less. And it's just like how how the fuck have we gotten to this point by being so good at working together and yet we're so bad at communicating yeah either way i really liked that story uh i need to hop off to go give my mom a rub all right i'll probably be back yeah gotcha. sure i'll be right back i need to go take a giant shit I was expecting something else. Oh. I thought it was like gonna be like a, a demon thing or a monster. Nope. It was just some a just drawer. A drawer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's just a drawer. The house the house is eating people. It's monster house, but less active. Uh I'll be back. Yeah. So talk talk to y'all soon, later probably. Gotcha. So small, why don't you fix that? settings all right I I have no idea if that's better or not that's a bit better but it does need to be bigger. Does the font need to be bigger on on the screen, or is it good as it is? Okay. So yeah, do you, do you, would you like? So yeah, Pokemon, can you guess what music this is? I want to see if you can guess where this comes from.
potion. I don't know. No, that is not. Plus the snoring. If you are curious. That is SCP-106's pocket dimension Intermu intermission sounds. Well, it's technically music, but yeah. Yeah, if you don't know, all the music that you hear now is from SCP Containment Breach. Because they released, the creators of SCP Containment Breach released the music for use. Which is why if you go on my channel and see the about area under facts, you'll see the names of the people. They didn't give links, so I'll try and find links of them later. case from far away you get you and no one's in call you you can listen to some SCP music that isn't copyrighted and if YouTube tries copywriting then fuck YouTube because I'm gonna keep using this music YouTube can go fuck itself I'm saying that even though I'm streaming to YouTube along with Twitch. Yeah, that's a real, great good idea to just say fuck you to YouTube while <laughs> being on that platform. <laughs> <laughs> Twitch to fuck themselves too, they don't care. <laughs> yeah, true. As long as we make them sweet money. Yeah, actually, I actually, I, I'm not sure if this is because the, the growth I've had, but like, I was shocked at how much I got as a payout for Twitch. Alright. The most I've ever gotten was, I believe, $101. That's it. However, this Twitch payout is double of that. That's how much I got. It was double. Yeah. I was like, holy fucking shit. Oh, goddamn. take double. <laughs> Hopefully it'll be the same next month, but I doubt it. I doubt it, but it would be pretty nice.
just waiting for Jiri to come back. These are just temporary. It's until I get my own VTuber designed overlays, which will happen probably way down the road. I highly doubt I'll see anything like that for a while. So, yeah. And this kind of fits the thing of my channel. I do more horror stuff than other things. Or I'm at least trying to. <laughs> but I will be bringing Digimon back next week. Because I gotta finish that shit. idea what the fuck to talk about. You were hearing nothing.
I'm trying to think of things to talk about. I, I have no idea what to talk about. <laughs> Oh yeah, since that we do have backroom stories, here's the interesting thing about the backrooms. If a baby somehow gets inside the backrooms, uh, there's uh, basically there is no chance that any of the monsters would ever harm the chunk of the baby. They'll always help it until it either escapes or grows up. That's an actual canon thing, so apparently babies can go into the back rooms. <laughs> they can no clip. Because apparently in the back rooms lore, when you no clip, it's because you've done something really bad in your life at some point. So when a baby goes in there, <laughs> so if they don't see it's the baby doing anything bad, so they don't harm it. Backrooms daycare center time. Oh my god. Oh my gosh, there's one other thing. In the back rooms, I kid you not, there is a monster called Sonic.exe. It, it's canon. They, they exist in the back rooms. Probably not as powerful, but they exist. What's your thoughts on Sonic Daddy XZ existing in the back rooms? It's interesting. <laughs> yeah. There's also on the first floor. There is an anomaly you can run into called Thomas the Train, which is just Thomas the Train, but it tries to gun at you and run you over. That, that's its only purpose. <laughs> that's its only purpose. made me start to think who would win in a fight the back room is Thomas the Train or Choo Choo Charles <laughs> Fight. 
Mr. True Charles Wilson, I think, because are guns even effective on it? Kind of? I mean, it pushes them back. I have nothing to do, I'm gonna go look at Choose Lights. You can join me, Booker, if you want. <laughs> I swear if June joined at that moment, that would have been amazing. Bookworm, I'm gonna read something to you. That. Oh, wait, this is not from. 
them. Never mind, hold on, let me get the actual thing. That was just someone complaining. Never mind, hold on, give me a moment. you to hear this too because I was just going to tell Bookram this. Oh, okay. This is from Unity itself. Today we announce a change to our business model which includes new additions to our subscription plans and the introduction of a runtime fee. We wanted to provide clarifying answers to the top questions most of you are asking. Yes, this is, this is a price increase and will only affect a small subset of current Unity editor users. Today, a large majority of U Unity Editor users are currently not paying anything or will not be affected by this change. The runtime, U Unity Runtime fee will not impact the majority of developers. Developers who are impacted are generally those who have successful games and are generating revenue way above the thresholds we outlined in our blog. This means that developers who are still building their business and growing the audience of their games will not, will not pay a fee. The program was assigned specifically this way to ensure developers could find success before the install fees it takes effect. I want to be clear that the counter unity, unity runtime fee install starts January 1st, 2024. It is not retroactive or perpetual. We will change once for our new install, not ongoing professional license royalty like preference share. We looked for ways to lessen the impact on developers and find ways to bring our runtime fee to zero. If you're using any of our ad products, you need games services, our cloud services, etc., please contact us to discuss discounts. said they'll take their uh, game to a different platform if this goes into effect. A different platform? Do they mean a different game engine? Game engine, yeah. Uh, hold on, let me go to the actual thing. I gotta go to here. I've heard Cult of the Lamb is going to be deleted January 1st. Intersloth said this, We use Unity to make our games. This would harm not only us, but fellow game studios of all budgets and sizes. If this goes through, we, we delay content and features our players actually want to port our game elsewhere, as others are also considering. But many developers won't have the time or means to do the same. Stop it. What the fuck? Wait, what? That's their message. Oh, stop it, what the fuck? Okay, that's valid. Wait, you didn't hear everything else I said? Did I get cut off? N no, I heard all of it. It's oh, just, okay. you're like, on behalf of all this other stuff, and uh, unless I missed something. Did you hear me say? They were basically oh, yeah. telling them off. Yeah. 
There's also going to be a new map coming in October 2023. A new map? Yep, it's called... Oh shoot, turn it off. Sound, turn sound off. The Fungal. What's the map going to be for? Don't know. It, well, it looks like just regular Among Us, but I'm not sure there's going to be new roles or not. Oh, Among Us. Yeah, Among Us. Wait, what's going to happen to Among Us? Doesn't it use that engine too? Yeah. Most of its stuff is free. So if it gets, like, starting to get charged, then the thing that was saved from destruction might be pushed back into destruction. Yeah. Also, also they did clarify that map's going to be free. Oh, okay. Yeah. That I was... kind of meant, like, oh. with the Unreal Engine, but, oh. Okay. Yeah. Oh, Patchy, you're back too? Well. Yeah. I guess this shows I really did poop a long time. Yeah. I've barely come back and Hatchet's already back. Hey, Hatchet. We were just talking about Unity being a bitch. Okay. You sound half dead. I. Mm hmm. Walking. The games I can think of offhand that use Unity Engine are, I believe Starbound uses it, Sloth Games, the people who made that, uh, I think they use Unreal Engine for most or all of their games, which includes that very popular game that people uh, kept comparing to Harvest Moon. And it also includes Among Us. I know that a lot of my porn games run on Unity. Yeah. Also, Bookworm said so we can cause companies to lose millions just by downloading their games. That makes no sense, honestly. Yeah, like deleting and installing again. Yeah. Honestly, I will say there's a lot of things that can cause something money, but. Downloading should not be, since it doesn't cause, it doesn't cost the engine money. Yeah. So they, that, that's not okay. And you know, people download and undownload things all the time. Yeah. So let's just hope they, so let's just hope they fucking get it through their skulls that this is an incredibly stupid idea before any major damage is done. It sounds like yeah. they're going to keep going through with it. They're gonna lose a lot of game. We're going back to the whole they... thing. Oh, sorry. That's the question. How are they even tracking that? I don't know. That's... Probably something That's a good that question, way. and how are they able to tell the difference between a free version and a paid-for version? How are they able to tell the difference between stolen and not stolen? Yeah. They're trying to claim they'll be able to tell, but I call bullshit. I mean, stolen in massive air quotes. Yeah. Well, well pirated does exist. Yeah. Well, yeah, but... But, like, internet pirating doesn't functionally steal anything. Like, Fair when enough. we say something is stolen, it implies that something has been taken away, when pirating is basically just copying something without permission. You know what that's but, valid. But this channel does not support piracy at all. Uh, we do not you can... support it, but we do acknowledge it exists. Yeah. Yes. And we are can saying you... that these people are basically patting the backs of pirates because, let's be honest, how are they going to tell the difference? Yeah. Yeah. Anyways, ready to go back to our reading, horror reading again? And, and, and remember, Twitch, no one in this voice call has ever resorted to the yo-ho-ho. -ho. 
at all? Definitely not. There are times I felt like a yo ho ho. What'd you say? Nothing, nothing. That was a bad joke. That was a bad joke. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, let's go back to horror reading. Oh, book says definitely not. <laughs> With uh, anti fascist chop chops. Yeah. Anyway, what's 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 next on the menu? All right, for uh, the vote of all three of you, we have either Turkey Molar, Hotel Morte, or Turn It Off. Would you like to vote? Oh, what? Turkey, Hotel Morte, or Turn It Off? For what? A horror story. I'm not sure what kind of horror story has turkey as the name, but... Well, the season is coming up in November. <laughs> are, are you choosing turkey food? Is it a little too early to choose turkey? Oh, uh, Bookworm says, I think Turn It Off would be a good to end on just for the name, Lawless's book. Uh <laughs> Wait, will this be the last story? Oh no, I still have the three book, uh, not bookworms, three backroom stories, <laughs> the three bookworm stories. Do you have, like, a specific time that you plan to cut it off at tonight? No. Food has just, fixed just the turkey until, one. Just, just go until, uh, you're tired of reading or you run out of stories? Yeah. Okay. Like I said, food has chosen turkey. Okay, so, uh... If... Wilkram says turkey. Uh, what's Wait, Jerry's says... and Hatchet's vote? I have no idea. <laughs> uh, Hotel Morte sounds interesting. Alright. I go with Hotel Morte. It's a tie! God damn it. Is, trying to think, isn't... Isn't Morte, uh, death in Spanish? Yes. Uh. All right. Uh, tails, turkey, uh, Morte, uh, heads. It is heads. Yay. Let's go to Hotel Death. Yeah. Correct. <laughs> oh my gosh. What? The name of the person who wrote this it 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 is just it's just perfect with the story. <laughs> okay. Uh, anyways. And is there any content warnings we need? Let's see. Uh I mean, there's jobs and occupations. <laughs> the most horrifying of all. Capitalism. <laughs> yeah. Warning. This story will contain themes of capitalism. <laughs> uh, anyways. Hotel Morte, The Unwanted Guest. Written by Hell Tourist. No doubt all of you horror aficionados will be familiar with the world's most famous, or perhaps infamous, spooky hotels. Whether it's an old establishment harboring restless spirits, or a rundown hostel that has been the scene of violent deaths, there is some time which draws us to the, these macabre, macabre venues. Okay, right. What? Right. I'm going to kill you. What? Macabre. Macabre. There's an R in it. Yeah, like macabre. Macabre. Oh. It's pronounced like some people pronounce it macabre, sometimes pronounced macabre. I'm very positive it's probably French with the r amount of. of 
letters used, but without sound. Right. It's true. But also, I'm pretty sure you said tings instead of something. Some no, tings. It, it, no, it says there is some time. It there says, is some time? Yeah, it's what it says. I did not re miss, right, read it. There is some time that draw. Okay, then that's Which just draws a us one. to these. Uh, yeah, then then that's just an actual grammatical error. Then, how, how do I say it again? It I it it, it seems like it's supposed to be saying something. There's something that draws us to this macabre. Macabre. Okay, there we go. All right, I'll reread it. Like to know what the origin of macabre is. Uh, French. Yeah. Ah. Fucking French. I knew it. Anyway, so yeah. let me reread anyway. that. There's, some, there's something which draws us to these macabre venues. Every hotel has its stories, of course. That's inevitable, given the number of people who come through them. But then there's the dark tourism industry, and those places that play on their history of paranormal incidents to bring in numbers. Hotel Morte isn't one of those establishments. You think the name alone would generate interest, but we'd like to keep a low profile. The Morte is located within an economically disadvantaged area in a small and unremarkable provincial city that few people will ever visit. We have no online presence and don't appear on any review sites. That's probably just as well, since I doubt our patrons would leave any positive feedback. Even the ghost hunters and paranormal investigators tend to give us a wide berth. We do get a, the occasional one who shows up and checks in, but they rarely last a night, soon realizing that they're out of their depth. As you might imagine, the Morte has seen better days. The hotel was built during the 1920s and was still a profitable concern right up to the 80s. But alas, our golden era is long gone. The building itself is crumbling. The electrics and plumbing are barely functional. Our furnishings are agent, our carpets are worn, and our mattresses lumpy and soiled. Needless to say, we don't have much in the way of amenities. No room service, no spa, and we definitely don't have Wi-Fi. What we do have is 20 usable rooms. That is to say, rooms deemed fit for human habitation. The other 80 are sealed off, their doors welded shut and windows boarded up. They aren't exactly vacant, however. When I walk the corridors at night, I can hear their former residents clawing at, at the inside of the doors, trying their best to get out, and after midnight, they start wailing, pleading for an escape they will never achieve. This is a deeply unnerving experience that you never really get used to. Given the frequent paranormal events which occur inside the Morte, it's no surprise that the few guests we do receive are rather unhinged. We do get our fair share of addicts and drifters who pass through, many of whom also have mental health problems. We do our best to look after them, but sadly, the very nature of our hotel doesn't exactly help in their recovery. We do have three long-term residents, all of whom are eccentric and rather troubled individuals with tragic past. For the sake of preserving their privacy, I shall refer to these three by their nicknames. First, there's the Major, a grizzled military veteran who acts the gentleman but is known for his violent outburst. Then there's the Widow, who appears much as like you would expect, an elderly woman, always dressed in black. She spends most of her time in our bar lounge, nursing a glass of sherry, puffing on a cigarette, and occasionally 
directing sarcastic and biting comments towards the other patrons. Finally, there's a senorita. She's different from the rest. Young, beautiful, and intelligent. But with a darkness inside of her, a troubled sadness which plagues her soul. But I'm not ready to talk about her just yet. And then you have the staff, all of whom identically also live in a hotel. First, there's me. I've worked and lived in the Morte for the past ten years. My job, well, I suppose you could call me the acting manager. Although I also fulfill the roles of front receptionist, concierge, and general handyman. I report directly to the hotel's owner, one Mr. Black. My boss is an old man and an absentee landlord. I can go years without seeing face to face. I do speak with Mr. Black on the phone every now and, and again, usually to ask adv for advice when I'm facing a particularly tricky situation. Mr. Black is a very intelligent man with vast experience, although I have no idea how he keeps the Morte operational when we've been running at a huge loss for decades. I suspect he may have other reasons for keeping our doors open, but I guess that's above my pay grade. Now you're probably wondering why I chose to work in this hellhole, let alone why I've stayed here for a decade. I'd like to say that well compensated for the work I do, but sadly this isn't the case. I earn a pittance, and the room that comes with the job is barely habitable. And unfortunately, I am not in possession of a set of rules I can follow that will keep me safe. The Morte is a chaotic, unpredictable, and often dangerous environment, and I rely on my wits and the help of my colleagues to help colleagues to keep me alive. No, the reason I work here is a very personal one. I have an unspeakable connection to the hotel, which means I can never leave. My staff team numbers two, both of whom also reside in the building. There's Mary, who is our resident maid and has an uninviable task of trying to maintain a basic level of cleanliness in an old building plagued by dust, cobwebs, and black mold. She's a hard worker and has particular skill in removing blood stains from sheets and carpets. Sadly, some of our less agreeable guests keep her busy in this regard. Then there's Owen, a resident chief, a resident chef, who also moonlights as our bar barkeeper. As unsurprisingly, we don't get many dinner reservations. I would describe Chef Owen as a weird guy with a very dark sense of humor. In addition to cooking and serving drinks, he has a rather unpleasant job, which will be become abundantly clear to you once I tell you tell my stories. We make an odd trio, but Mary, Owen, and I have worked and lived together for years, and I've learned to watch each other's backs. I guess they're the closest thing I have to friends in this world. As I explained, much of the hotel building is now off limits, either because the rooms are out of use or because they're occupied by entities one would rather avoid. In addition to our 20 unusable rooms, the main hubs of activity include our lobby and reception area. You would generally find me behind the desk waiting on guests who rarely appear and watching a phone that almost never rings. When I'm not engaging in other duties, I'm stuck here, passing hours by, reading paperback novels. Anything but horror, I get enough of that in my day job. I stare at the rotating glass doors 
reminiscing about better times and days before I become trapped inside of this hellish place. Mary's domain is the laundry room down in the basement, and Owen rotates between the kitchen and bar lounge, although I often need to remind him to remove his blood-stained apron before he starts serving drinks. The bar slash lounge is the closest thing to be had to a social hub in the Morte, and it's where our handful of guests tend to congregate in the evenings. It was once a rather quaint Art Deco style bar room, but has long since deteriorated along with the rest of the building. With cracked tiles, dusty old bottles, and tired old furnishings being all that's left of its former glory, the lighting is also poor, but that's the way our guests seem to prefer it. Our restaurant is barely used, but also doubles as our conference room. Believe it or not, but we do get the occasional group that wishes to rent it out. And more on that later. Other than these very basic facilities, the Marte has a few other areas of note, but most of them are best avoided for any extended length of time. Our elevator is ancient, creaky, and unreliable. Prone to regular breakdowns, I've lost count of how many times I've been stuck in that damn lift, needing to be rescued by Owen or Mary. Often, this is due to simple mechanical failures, but sometimes the lift is paralyzed by one of the malevolent beings that frequently pass through the hotel. It brings an icy chill down to my spine every time I find myself trapped in that pitch black box listening to the foul crackles of one or more of those devilish fiends. And then there's the dreaded corridors on each floor that are frightening space, especially at night. Once I finish my shift, I speed through the hellish labyrinth on the sixth floor, rushing to my room whilst trying to ignore the bone-chilling den and avoid seeing the unex inexplainable entities who stalk the dark corners always trying to draw in the living for their own nefarious purposes. Once I reach my safe haven, I shut the door and lock myself in, putting in my earplugs in an attempt to drown out the inhuman screams, which continue until daybreak. So I guess I've given you a flavor of what the Hotel Morte is, as you probably guessed. I'm not writing this to tell for business. In fact, my best advice is to stay well away, which is why I shall not reveal the hotel's location. Nevertheless, I do wish to share my stories because I believe the many victims of the Morte should be remembered. Let me begin by telling you the tale of Mr. Hillman, one of the of our most infamous guest who I believe had a very eventful stay at our little establishment. Now I knew Mr. Hillman was troubled the first time I met him. He was a heavy middle-aged man with a thinning hairline. I wouldn't say he was physically unattractive. When he was when he first arrived at the hotel's reception, I noted how he was fairly well turned out, clean shaven, and wearing an inexpensive but neat suit and tie. But when you've been in the business as long as I have, you learn how to recognize the bad ones. He wasn't exactly rude when he checked in, but his whole demeanor and personality seemed off. I sensed a darkness in him and saw the barely suppressed malice behind his eyes. I was also suspicious of the leather briefcase he carried, somehow sensing it contained unsavory items. Yes, sadly, Mr. Hillman is the type of unwanted guest we occasionally received at the Morte, perhaps drowned in by the darkness and the evil presence which stalks our corridors. I would have liked to refuse him a, a room, but knew Mr. Black would never allow this. Nevertheless, 
I knew we needed to keep a close eye on him, and so we did. It was 10 o'clock on a Friday night when the first altercation occurred. I just finished my shift at the front desk and was having a solitary drink while working up the curse to face those hellish corridors on 6th floor. Our bar was about as busy as it gets. All three of, of our long-term guests were in attendance, nursing their drinks and killing time. The widow was sat in her usual spot, a darkened booth in the far corner of the lounge and facing the bar. White-haired, wrinkled, and wearing a black dress and shawl, the elderly woman made for a so sorry sight as she sipped her sherry and puffed on her cigarettes. There was always an awful sadness in her eyes, betraying the hurt and grief she carried with her always. The major stood at a far end of the bar, striking a confident pose as he drank brandy and closely watched over his fellow patrons. The ex-officer was always well-dressed, wearing a tweed suit and his regimental tie. He sported a gray mustache and wore thick spectacles, giving him the appearance of a harmless intellectual type. But this was merely a guise. The major is, in fact, a highly trained killer, and he's lost none of his edge since retiring from the service. And finally, there was the senorita, who sat in the middle of the bar, nursing a glass of white wine. White wine. As always, I was struck by the young woman's beauty and elegance, her flowing dark hair, olive skin, soft eyes, and bright floral dress. I wanted so badly to speak with her, but I know she wouldn't talk to me. It hurt, but I would continue to respect her wishes, for now at least. Ellen was working behind the bar, serving our patrons while sporting a wide grin. Our chef is a tall and thin man with a devilish look in his eyes and a near permanent smile on his lips. He is anything but wholesome. I've worked with Owen for years, but the man still surprises me. And I've never figured out what makes him tick. In one sense, he is my closest friend and the confidante. But the man also scares the hell out of me. I know what he does in that kitchen, and it turns my stomach. Mr. Hillman came into the lounge around 9.30 p.m. He'd already been drinking that evening. This became obvious due to his slurred speech and the smell of alcohol on his breath. Nevertheless, our guest took a stool and ordered a large whiskey downing it in one before demanding a second. I became concerned whenever he turned his attentions to the senorita, taking a seat beside her and trying to start a conversation. Frankly, the exchange was painful to watch. Hillman seemed to be trying to chat her up, but the senorita was having none of it, and clearly she was well out of his league. I noted how his body language became more aggressive as the conversation dragged on, and she continued to give him the cold shoulder. I was very worried about the senorita's safety, but knew she wouldn't appreciate me trying to intervene. Besides, she could look after herself, as she's proved many times in the past. I remembered a moment when the situation dis deteriorated. Hillman leaned forwards trying to touch the girl. She reacted in an instant, jumping off her chair and stepping back whilst clearing him down and shouting, Don't you dare! Predictably, Mr. Hillman reacted badly to this firm rejection. Standing up from his stool, his face red with fury as he clenched his, fit, his fist. You stuck up, bitch! He spat, his eyes narrowing, as he prepared for violence. I could no longer sit and watch, and so made ready to intervene, but this proved unnecessary as the other stepped in first. You, sir, are sorry excuse for a man. 
That was the widow awakened from her grief as she spoke up in the girl's defense. If my husband were still alive, he would teach you a damn lesson. Kilman shot her a hateful look, sh shouting, Keep out of this, you old bat! The Major was next to speak, and as always, his words hit home. You've had too much to drink, young man. I suggest you call it a night. His words were typically polite on the surface, but were spoken in a tone which left no doubt as to their meaning. He also shot him in a killer glare, holding his gaze after he said his piece. I imagine the Major had given that looked at dozens of men over the years, just before he snapped their necks. I looked on in shock, awe, as Mr. Hillman's face turned pale, and he quickly backed off, almost stumbling over the bar stool as he retreated. Hillman had been humiliated. Hillman had been humiliated, and clearly wasn't happy about it, and so he ranted angrily. Angrily, while splitting around, screaming, Tell with this lot of you, you're all a bunch of goddamn freaks. This place is dead anyway. Total dump. I'm gonna, I'm going out to find myself a real party. And with that, he stormed out, slamming the door shut behind him. I felt huge relief at seeing him leave and looked over to Owen, who was still standing behind the bar. He remained silent throughout the tense encounter, although I noticed his hand was under the tail and remembered, and that's where he kept his meat cleaver. That guy's trouble. We haven't heard the last of him, said Owen. I nodded my head in agreement, knowing he was right. I didn't think this was going to end well. I took another drink to calm my nerves before leaving the lounge and ascending the floors, running the gauntlet to reach the relative safety of my room. Thankfully, my short journey was fairly uneventful on that night. The elevator ran smoothly, and my walk along the sixth floor corridor went uninterrupted. That is, until I reached my bedroom door. I was fumbling with my keys when I felt the hairs on my back of my neck stand up, and my sixth sense told me I was being watched. I turned around and a shot coming face to face with the senorita. She was stand just standing there behind me with a look of repro reproach in her eyes. The lights above her flickered as she stared me down giving the young lady an unsettling appearance. I was in shock because I couldn't remember the last time she'd spoken with me. I've yearned for a chance to reconnect, but now she was here, found myself speechless. Therefore, it was left to Senorita to break the silence. I saw you watching me at the bar. What are you going to do? Jump in and save me? Play my knight in shining armor? I was taken aback, barely able to stutter my response. I wanted to make sure you were safe. She scoffed in contempt while swallowing her eyes. It's a bit late for that, isn't it? I lowered my head in shame as her words were like a dagger through my heart. The worst thing was, I knew she was right. Why? She cried angrily. Why are you still here? Why can't you leave me be? I began to sob emotionally as I struggled to respond. You know, I can't do that. I whimpered tearfully. She shook her head in disgust, her voice full of sorrow as she spoke her parting words. There's nothing I can do for you. No relief I can give you. 
please just leave me alone. And with that, she left me, disappearing into the darkness and leaving me alone with my pain. I didn't sleep at night as my encounter with the senorita kept running through my head. I was so upset that I had forgotten all about Mr. Hillman and his bad behavior. Unfortunately, he also occupied a room on the sixth floor, only a few doors down from my own. He came in after midnight, making an awful racket that would wake the dead. I listened to the muffled sound of his voice and realized he wasn't alone. There was a woman with him. I could hear her laughing as at his undoubtedly snide comments. I assumed she was a lady of the night, as I couldn't imagine a man as vile as Mr. Hillman could charm any woman he, he was in pain. I lay on my hard mattress and continued to listen carefully as they entered his room and shut the door behind them. I didn't like it, but remembered Mr. Black's motto, the customer is rarely right. But we must suffer their excesses. Besides, I was exhausted, both physically and emotionally drained. And so I closed my eyes and fell into a deep slumber. I woke to the sound of screaming, jumping up from my bed as all my senses came to life. I groggily glanced at my alarm clock and saw the time was 3.33 a.m., right in the middle of the witching hour. The screaming grew louder, a blood-curdling cry from a woman in mortal danger. I thought it could be connected to Mr. Hillman and his late-night visitor, but couldn't be sure, as disembodied screams were not uncommon along the hotel's haunted corridors. I know what you're thinking, and yes, I should have left the sanctuary of my room to investigate, but I've learned a long ago to never walk the hall halls between the hours of 3 and 4 a.m. My actions may well have been cowardly, but I haven't survived this long by taking unwise risks. Next, I heard the sounds of a scuffle as furniture was knocked over and walls were slammed. Soon the screams were soon replaced by the terrible sound of a death rattle. Then there was an awful silence. I knew straight away that the Hotel Marte had taken another victim, and I also realized there would be a mess to clear up in the morning. Unsurprisingly, I didn't sleep another wink that night, and by 7 a.m., I found myself standing inside room 66, Mr. Hillman's room, observing the bloody mess he left behind. Mary, a resident maid, was standing with her back to the door, facing the blood splattered bed and shaking her head in disgust. I superstitiously walked up behind her, making my presence known by clearing my throat. Mary turned to look at me and I saw the anger in her tired eyes, noting her drawn face set under fading red curls and her traditional maid's uniform that was now worn out and threadbare. Sadly, the many years trapped in this hellish establishment had taken their toll on this poor woman. She remained unprofessional with her words, but I can hear the emotion in her voice as she spoke. Really, sir? You so I so not do. These sheets will have to go. My carpet will be permanently stained. Frankly, sir, this guest is a little better than a savage animal. I nodded my head meekly and muttered, Where is the deceased? She didn't answer verbally, instead of pointing sternly towards the bathroom. I reluctantly made my way to the closed bathroom door, my nostrils filled with a, with a, sad, with a sadly familiar stench of death. I turned the handle and discovered a sickening scene inside. The corpse of a young woman dumped in the blood-filled bathtub, semi-nude and stabbed multiple times through the chest, her dead eyes still open and staring up at the ceiling, her face frozen with, 
with an expression of absolute terror, a permanent reminder of the horrifying last moments before her violent death. I stood in the doorway for a moment, sickened by the sight with my heart filled with shame, as I recalled how I'd done nothing to prevent this heinous crime. I was brought back to reality by a voice from my rear. Told you it was trouble. I swung around to see Owen standing beside Mary, his usual grin no longer present. Yeah, I agreed solemnly. Where is Mr. Hillman? Owen shrugged his shoulders. Don't know, boss. I am going out early this morning, but all his stuff is still here, so I guess he'll be back. I sighed out loud, raking my exhausted brain as I tried to figure out what to do. Okay, I finally answered. I know this is bad, but I'm going to need you both to work with me on this. Mary, please do your best to clean up the blood. And Owen, can you take care of the body? Sure thing, boss, our chef replied, his face suddenly lighting up. This worried me as I... I'd seen that look before. Now, Owen, I said sternly, I don't want her going through your kitchen like the others. This le young lady deserves better. Surprisingly, Owen seemed aggrieved by the accusation. What do you take me for, boss? I am no heartless monster. I shall wait until dark and drive her out to the woods. Find a peaceful burial spot. Nice and respectful. I nodded my head, feeling somewhat reassured. And what about the other guest? Mary asked sharply. I experienced the stabbing pain of anxiety as I considered her question. Sadly, this was a task I could not delegate. I will speak with Mr. Hillman, I replied. And so I left my staff to their unpleasant work while I went downstairs and began my shift. I carried out my daily task and impatiently waited for Mr. Hillman to return. He arrived back at the hotel around lunchtime. I noted how he wore clean clothes without presumably discarded, having presumably discarded his blood-stained garments from the night before. He shot me a look as he entered the lobby through the rotating door. And I tried to see any signs of guilt or remorse in his bloodshot eyes. But alas, all I saw was darkness staring back at me. Mr. Hillman was evidently not in the mood for conversation as he attempted to rush past my reception desk, tightly clutching his briefcase, which I now believe contained a murder kit. I heard my throat speaking up to stop him in his tracks. Excuse me, sir. Might I have a word with you? I would have used much harsher, harsher words if it were up to me, but Mr. Hillman was still a customer, and so Mr. Black would insist on basic level of courtesy. He turned around and glared at me with hate in his eyes, practically spitting out his reply. What do you want? I took a deep breath, meeting his hateful gaze as I spoke my piece. Sir, I must tell you... That the incident in your room last night is considered a severe breach of our residency rules. With all due respect, sir, the condition your room was left in is unacceptable. I expected him to react aggressively to my rebuke, but instead he bellowed out laughter, emitting a sick, distant cackle, which filled the lobby. So you're not happy? He replied mockingly. And what the hell are you going to do about it? I felt the anger rising up in my stomach and struggled to control it as I spoke my next words through clenched teeth. I'm sorry, I I'm sorry, sir, but I'm going to have to ask you to pack your bags and leave. He laughed again, louder this time. I'm not going anywhere, my friend. If you got such a problem with what I did, why don't you call the cops? Suddenly... I lost my previous held confidence, finding myself unable to respond. 
Yeah, I thought not, said Hellman, as a sickening smirk appeared on his lips. I know what goes on here. I hear strange no noises late at night, and a banging and a screaming. This is no normal hotel, and you sure don't want the authorities poking their noses in. Besides, I rather like it here. This is where I belong. No, my friend. I intend to stay here for a long time, and there's nothing you can do about it. In fact, I would strongly advise you to stay the hell out of my way, or else you may end up dead in my tub. He cackled once more, slapping me hard. Slapping me hard on his shoulder before casting me a parting predatory glare. And with that, he left to the elevator and up to his room, no doubt planning his next murder. I was left seething with anger, barely able to contain my hatred of that vile man. It took a moment to compose myself and consider my next move. At this point, there was really only one option left to open to me. The time had come to phone Mr. Black. The owner of the Hotel Marte didn't sound particularly pleased to hear from me. Mr. Black expected me to handle difficult situations on my own initiative wherever possible. However, my employer became more sympathetic after hearing my predicament. Hmm, he mumbled thoughtfully, his soft voice carrying down the line. This is quite the conundrum. Very unfortunate situation, indeed. Our guest is right, of course, but we, can, we cannot contact the authorities on this. At the same time, we certainly do not want this unpleasant individual to remain in our hotel. So, what should we do? I asked impatiently. Mr. Black laughed softly before replying. My good man, have you learnt nothing from your time in service? Here at the Hotel Morte, we handle such matters in-house. Our staff and long-term residents, we are a light family. Perhaps our relations are not always amicable, but we've always come together in the face of external threats. Speak to your people, and they will advise what action to take. Now, if there's nothing else, I will bid you good day. After that, he abruptly ended the call, leaving me listening to an ominous dial tone. I knew this was as I knew this was as much advice as I would get from the enigmatic Mr. Black. And of course he was right. We needed to deal with Mr. Hillman's situation ourselves. So I called a meeting in the lounge that very afternoon, and we made our plans, preparing to put them into motion. That evening, I sat up, up in my room and stayed alert, ignoring the usual bumps in the night that were all too common in the morte, waiting for the sound of our unwanted guest returning from his night's exter exertions. I felt extremely tense, shaking with anxiety and anticipation when I heard his muffled voice and, foot and the footsteps along the corridor. A surge of adrenaline kept me going as I opened my bedroom door and stepped out into the danger zone. Mr. Hillman was outside his room, fiddling with his keys in the lock. He turned to face me, and the expression was one of pure rage. There was a lady of the night with him, a girl so young she could have been his daughter. She was pale-skinned, thin, and wore a short cocktail dress and heels. I noted how her pupils were dilated, and so guessed she was an addict. Thinking deep in, into my reserves, I spoke up defiantly as I confronted the vile men. Now, Mr. Hillman, perhaps I wasn't clear when we spoke this afternoon. We will have no repeat of last night's unpleasant, unpleasantness. Hillman was clearly furious, and he snarled at me through clenched teeth. Get back in your damned room. 
I took a deep breath and shook my head in negative. I will not, I replied firmly. You son of a bitch, he growled. I'll gut you like a damn fish. Hillman pushed the girl aside and charged at me, reaching into his jacket to withdraw a sharp butcher's knife. I reacted on pure instinct, fighting for my life as I grabbed hold of his wrist and desperately struggled to disarm him. As we fought, I glanced over his shoulder and saw a young lady, her eyes wide with terror. Run! I screamed. Thankfully, she obeyed, sprinting down the corridor in the opposite direction. We had anticipated the situation, so Mary and the widow were waiting for the fleeing girl and would get her to safety. But now, I was the one in mortal danger. Mr. Hillman was stronger than he looked, and so he soon got the better of me, breaking free from my grasp and throwing me to the ground. To the ground. I looked up fearfully as my attacker, as he advanced upon me with pure hatred, and his eyes and his knife raised, ready to strike. You bastard! He cried. I warned you not to interfere in my business. Now you're going to pay. I crawled backwards, praying that the cavalry would arrive in time to save me. Thankfully, my friends didn't let me down. Now, now then, sir, this really will not do," said the major. "He's got that right." added Owen. Hillman turned around in shock, suddenly finding himself confronted by two men, both advancing upon him with menacing intent. The Major carried a machete, and Owen was armed with his trusty meat cleaver. Darden looks in their eyes confirmed they meant business. Hillman gasped and slowly started to back away. As he did so, the banging started as the entities trapped inside a vacant room slammed their fists against the inside of the doors, hammering in unison to create an ominous and intimidating drumbeat. For the first time, I saw genuine fear in the killer's ghostly pale face, as suddenly the, the hunter had become the hunted. The Major and Owen were blocking his route to the elevator, and so Mr. Hillman fled in the opposite direction. While still wielding his knife, he headed for a staircase just as we anticipated. I got back up on my feet and joined my armed comrades as we pursued our quarry. In a blind panic, Hillman threw open the door and stepped out onto the staircase. That's when the next part of our plan was put into action. Suddenly, the senorita emerged from the shadows, approaching Hillman from behind and taking him completely by surprise. She got right up in his face and shouted, Boo! Hillman cried out in dismay and stepped backwards, losing his footing and falling down the stairs, his body tumbling heavily until he hit the bottom. He turned over and I saw his own knife was now protruding from his chest, buried deep in his ribcage. The monster's eyes were now filled with shock and fear as he began to choke on his own blood his life slowly and painfully draining away. I think we all felt a grim satisfaction in watching the serial killer die, but Owen was the first one to speak the words. A job well done, he stated firmly. Indeed, I replied while shooting our chef a sly look. I assume you can take care of this? Of course. Owen confirmed. And feel free to dispose of his body in whatever way you see fit, I added. I watched with a combination of concern and morbid curiosity as Owen's face lit up, and he replied, With pleasure, sir. All traces of Mr. Hillman were gone by the next day, and no one ever came looking for him. Things returned to normal soon after or at least as normal as they ever get in a place like Hotel Morte. We'd, we'd worked together to take care of Hillman. Sadly, the senorita went back to ignoring me. I would keep working on her, however, hoping against hope 
that she would one day forgive me. It was two days later when I received an unexpected phone call from the ever mysterious Mr. Black. So, he began, I understand our issues with the troublesome guest have been resolved. Yes, I replied, somewhat puzzled, but not really surprised. Somehow, Mr. Black always knew what was happening in the Morte, even if it wasn't physically present. Very good, he replied. I always had faith in you to find a satisfactory, satisfactory solution. But this isn't the reason I called you. No? I said, now feeling more than slightly apprehensive. There's a special event coming up, which I want to discuss with you. He continued. A small convention of sorts. Thirteen attendees, all requiring food, beverages, and room for two nights. I could hardly believe what I was hearing. I would have thought this was a joke. But Mr. Black never had much of a sense of humor. Really? I exclaimed. They, they want to hold their convention here? Yes, indeed. He confirmed. This group has a special interest in our little establishment. And the unique animalities that the Morte office. Now, do you think you can handle... This event? I almost laughed, struggling to find the words to respond. Well, I suppose so. If we use all of our spare bedrooms and set up the dining hall, yeah, I guess we can make do. There was a lengthy pause on the other end of the line before my employer finally spoke again. Hmm, it's not that I don't trust your abilities, but this is a very important customer. And so I think I will need to attend in person, just to make sure everything runs smoothly. I shall see you next Friday to confirm the details. Good day. And then he hung up, leaving me to my thoughts. I'll admit to feeling deeply concerned, but also intrigued. I was facing three virtually unprecedented events within the next week. A fully booked hotel, a convention, and a personal visit by the hotel's owner. I expected it to be an, an eventful few days, but could never have anticipated the bloody carnage that would follow. And so, readers, if you'll indulge me for a second occasion, I'll tell you the tale of the hotel convention straight from the depths of hell. Until next time, my friends. And that's it. That's where it ends. Yeah. That was pretty amazing. It was like, okay, I'll be entirely honest. About ha I, I missed about half of it because I was on Twitter. But oh, from from what I was listening to, that was really good. Yeah. Has the has the sequel been uh um been uploaded? I don't know. I can see. Yeah, I really like that. Oh. What's up? So I looked at the, I clicked on the person, um, there's Hotel Morte, the convention, and Hotel Morte checking out. Hmm? Tis a trilogy. Yeah. But I think I only want to get through the stories half now. We can go back to these later, so I'll, I'll bookmark it so I remember. That's fair. That said, as a side note, something very funny I saw while scrolling Twitter is this uh, pretty standard... I don't know if they're a parody, but like pretty obviously fascist account. Yeah. Where they post they post a photo, uh, 
where they they have their face uh, censored with an emoji with sunglasses, and they're in a suit and tie, and the and the tweet says, uh, it's September thirteenth. The tweet says tomorrow's the big day. No expensive lawyer, and they put the lawyer in three uh, echoes, i.e., indicating all lawyers are Jews now. What? Yeah, the um, like the That's three parentheses. That's a new belief for certain individuals. Yeah. I mean, yeah, but yeah, it, right. If you don't know, the three echoes or like three parentheses around a word, uh, if you see someone using that and they aren't themselves openly Jewish, they're probably a Nazi. Oh, <laughs> it's uh, it's it's used among fascists to indicate that something is Jewish. Also, Aderna, I did see your, uh, I'm searching right now, but during that story, I did drink. <laughs> I, I should say, indicating that they think something is Jewish with their bigot brain. But anyway, yeah. so the, the, the tweet is, tomorrow's the big day. No expensive lawyer necessary to convince the judge I'm a good dad. I will be representing myself. This white man is fighting for his children. Oh. This yeah, is like a, a retweet. Well. <laughs> well, this is a retweet. Uh, five hours ago, he retweeted it. <laughs> it says, no custody, supervised visitation on holidays. Sitting in my car right now, feeling totally numb. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what I expected. I mean, I shouldn't clap, but it's one of the Nazi here parties. It's so good. It's, just it's one of the angry German people, yeah. so I, I don't feel bad. I just I clap. Yeah. Good for good on that judge piecing things together. I, I'm not sure if this is just like a parody account or if this is genuine. Either way, it's comedy gold. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's genuine, and that's what makes it hilarious. Adern says it is a parody account. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Eh, it's still, I, I still think it's comedy gold. Yeah, that's a fair point. That's still pretty good. <laughs> it is a parody. Yeah. Hmm. I have the true account blocked and muted. Oh, okay. So, okay. So this is Wait, like someone. That... Uh, let me see. Who? Uh, the, it's a parody account of someone that is called the quote unquote the culture critic. Oh, I have no idea who that is. Yeah, they're they're just some very vocal Nazi on Twitter. I, I guess I shouldn't be saying that, but Twitch very hasn't seen Very vocal uh, Nazi hair party, or angry German party. The mustache yeah, uh, party. Very vocal uh, bad mustache. guy. Very, very but, vocal mustache party member. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, either way, that being a parody account, that's still fucking funny as hell. That's a very good joke. Yeah, I think the one part in the, in the story that I liked reading the most was when I was voicing Mr. Black. Because, like, there wasn't actually, like, dot, dot, the like, three dot pauses or whatever. I just thought that adding those pauses would have made him speaking a lot better. I'm not sure. He definitely seemed like an interesting character. Yeah. So I I did that on purpose. It, it wasn't like that in, written down. It was just I decided to do that myself. So right, did you hydrate and stretch? Yeah, I just said I did. <laughs> yeah. 
Right. Okay, now I'm happy because I found a picture of a, what looks to be a very tiny, beautiful little jumping spider. Ah, okay, Derna. Yeah. Uh, the next story I'm choosing, I want to go ahead and do with uh, Turkey Molar. Then I'm thinking I just read the rest of the uh, the three backrooms chapters and end it off of Turn It Off, because that would be funny. Okay. Uh, I was gonna ask, would you would it be alright if I read something? Uh sure, do you have something? Yeah, I was thinking I would just read the Raven by Edgar Allan Poe. Okay. I didn't say anything so I was I wasn't sure if you were up to it or not. Yeah. Yeah. I I'm I'm feeling it. Partially just because I actually want to just it's been a long time since I read the poem, so I kind of want to just read the poem, but yeah. I like overlooking it. Yeah, I, I will say, I... I... What the fuck, Adirna? But Anyway, I'm glad Adirna didn't, uh, hear the first story of the night, because that was something. That was something. Wait, what'd you say? I said I'm glad Adirna didn't hear the first story of the night, because that was something. Uh... Werewolf ears. If I it has nothing to do trash. with werewolves. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like it would have been significantly better if there was some fluffy boys in it. Yeah. Honestly, it would have been better if it was literally just a werewolf going in there for a haircut. True. Okay, uh. Jesus Christ, shut the fuck up, 682. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Right? Look what? in chat. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so now you have 35 minutes. Well, none of the stories I'm reading will have cuss words in it, so that's not gonna hurt me. <laughs> I mean, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, not, it's not much of a thing, but... Yeah. Uh, uh, let's see, where is it? Scare Bright, there, turn off. I forgot oh. to turn it off. <laughs> Scare Bright was still on. So, I thought, if I got, I think what my thought process was, if I got rid of stream alerts, like, the thing that you can put bits and whatnot, uh, yeah. that it would turn off automatically a Scare Bright, but, nah. <laughs> it doesn't turn off redeems for some reason. Yeah. Uh, I I do find it funny that that uh that I was correct. It was called Satan's Suckle. I'm sorry. What did you say? I I said I, I find it I I, I still find find it funny that I was correct about the Borderlands area. Being called Satan Suckle. <laughs> oh yeah. Uh... <laughs> that was amazing. Anyways, are you ready? I am ready. I have my reading companion. Okay. He is a good. He is a good boy. Justice? Are they yes, gay? It is... No, it is not. I don't think <laughs> Festus. Are you gay? <laughs> I don't think Pet Festus Pet is a different cat. Festus is just good boy. Yeah, Pe Pe <laughs> Peppy and Olaf slash Ula. Th those two are our gay boys because they're uh, they're very you don't frequently. Need to explain how gay your cats are. They 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 very frequently just. You, you don't need to explain how gay your cats are. <laughs> You don't yeah. need to explain. Yeah, we get it. But they're gay. <laughs> yes, we believe you. Are you sure? Peppy and Olaf are gay together. They do things gay cats do together. <laughs> anyway. Anyways. Uh, content warning for talking birds. Uh. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> There's a talking bird. I, I don't know what to say. 
There's some weird triggers out there. You don't know. <laughs> All right. That should just be for Bright's channel. Fuck you, Bookworm. True. True. No, it's not. Uh, all right. The Raven by Edgar Allan Poe. Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered, weak and weary, over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore. While I nodded, nearly napping, suddenly there came a tapping, as of someone gently rapping, rapping at my chamber door. Tis some visitor, I mutter, tapping at my chamber door. Only this, and nothing more. Ah, distinctly I remember. It was in the bleak of December, and each separate dying ember wrought its ghost upon the floor. Eagerly I wished the morrow, vainly I had sought to borrow from my bookcase surcease of sorrow, sorrow for lost Lenore. For the rare and radiant maiden, whom the angels named Lamor, Lenore. Nameless here, forevermore. And the silken, sad, uncertain rustling of each purple curtain thrilled me, filled me with fantastic terrors never felt before. So that now, so still the beating of my heart, I stood repeating, "'Tis some visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door." Some late visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door. This it is, and nothing more. Presently my soul grew stronger, hesitating then no longer. Sir, said I, or madam, truly your forgiveness I implore. But the fact is I was napping, so and so gently you came rapping, and so faintly you came tapping, tapping at my chamber door that I scarce was sure I heard you. Here I opened wide the door. Darkness there, and nothing more. Deep into that darkness peering, long I stood there wandering, fearing, doubting, dreaming dreams no mortals ever dared to dream before. But the silence was unbroken, stillness gave no token, and the only word that there spoken was the whispered word, Lenore. This I whispered, and an echo murmured back the word, Lenore. Merely this, and nothing more. Back into the chamber turning, all my soul within me burning, all my soul within me burning. Soon again, I heard a tapping somewhat louder than before. Surely, said I, surely that is something, that is something at my window latest. Let me see then, what a three, what three it is, and this mystery explore. Let my heart be still a moment and this mystery explore. Tis the wind and nothing more. Open here I flung the shutter, when, with many a flirt and a flutter, in there stepped a stately raven, the saintly days of yore. Not the least obeisance made he, not a minute stopped or stayed he, but with mien of lord or lady perched upon my chamber door, perched upon a bust of palace just above my chamber door, perched and sat and nothing more. Then this ebony bird beguiling my sad fancy into smiling, by the grave and stern decorum of the 
countenance it wore. Though thy crest be shorn and shaven, thou, I said, art sure no craven, ghastly grim and ancient raven, wandering from the nightly shore. Tell me what thy lordly name is on the ninth Plutonian shore. Quoth the raven, nevermore. Much I marvel this ungangly fowl to hear discourse so plainly, though its answer little meaning, little relevancy bore. For we cannot help agreeing that no living human being ever yet was blessed with seeing bird above his chamber door, bird or beast upon the sculptured bust above his chamber door, with such a name as nevermore. But the raven, sitting lonely on the placid bust, spoke only that one word, as if his soul in that one word he dwelt. Nothing further than he uttered, not a feather than he fluttered, till I scarcely more than muttered, muttered, other friends have flown before. On the morrow he will leave me, as my hopes have flown before. Then the bird said, nevermore. Startled at the stillness broken, by reply so aptly spoken, doubtless, said I, what it utters is its only stock in store, caught from some unhappy master whom unmerciful disaster followed fast and followed faster till his song one burden bore till the dirges of his hope and melancholy burden bore of never never more but the raven still beguiling my sad fancy into smiling straight i wheeled a cushioned seat in front of bird and bust and door then upon the velvet sinking, I betook myself to thinking, but myself to linking, fancy unto fancy, thinking that this ominous bird of door, what this grim, ungangly, ghastly, gaunt, and ominous bird of yore meant in croaking, nevermore. This I sat engaged in guessing, but no syllable expressing, the fowl whose fiery eyes now burned into my bosom's core. This and more I sat divining, with my head at ease, with my head at ease reclining, on the cushion's velvet lining that the lamp light gloated o'er. But whose velvet violet lining with the lamp light gloating o'er, she shall press. Uh, nevermore. Then, methought, the air grew denser, perfumed from an unseen censer, swung by seraphim whose footfalls tinkled on the tufted floor. Wretch, I cried, thy God, thy God hath lent thee by these angels he hath sent thee, respite, respite and nepenthe from thy memories of, Lenor, of Lenore. Quaff, oh quaff this kind Nepenthe, and forget this lost Lenore. Quaff the raven, nevermore. Prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet still, if bird or devil, whether tempter sent, or whether tempter tossed thee from ashore. Desolate yet, all undaunted, on this desert land enchanted, on this home by horror haunted, tell me truly, I implore, is there, is there a balm in Gilead? Tell me, tell me, I implore, quoth the raven, nevermore. Prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet still, if bird or devil, by the heaven that bends above us, by the God, by the God we both adore, 
tell this soul with sorrow laden, if within the distant Aden it shall clasp a sainted maiden, whom the name who the angels named Lenore. Clasp a rare and radiant maiden, whom the angels named Lenora. Quoth the raven, nevermore. Be that word our sign in parting. Bird or fiend, I shrieked, upstarting. Get thee back into the tempest and the night's Plutonian shore. Leave no black plume as a token of that lie thy ship. Thy soul hath spoken, leave my loneliness unbroken, quit the bust above my door, take thy beak from out my heart, and take thy form from off my door, quoth the raven, nevermore. And the raven, never flitting, still is sitting, still is sitting. On the pallid bust of Pallas just above my chamber door. And his eyes have all the seeming of a demon's that is dreaming, and the lamplight o'er him streaming throws his shadow on the floor. And my soul from out that shadow that lies floating on the floor shall be lifted nevermore. That is The Raven by Edgar Allan Poe. Nice. You read it with a lot of passion. Yeah. That's nice. This was... The, the, this poem has a lot of meaning to me. It's uh, it, it was basically the poem that inspired me to start trying out poetry in general. That makes sense. And as well as the fact that it's a poem that's very explicitly about grief, and that speaks to me quite a bit. Yeah. It's a pretty dark poem. Not the most horror-inducing, but I feel it fits. Mm -hmm. All right. Welcome to game uh, clap emojis. Thank you, book. Also, I guess now the real question is, which bird is better is is easier to deal with? Nevermore or bright? Fuck you. I think I'd probably choose nevermore. Just have a raven sitting above my door. Now the game will be here. All right, everyone ready for the next one? What was the next one going to be? Uh, Turkey Molar. Oh wow, this is an old story. It's from June 6, 2015. Oh wow. Well, let's hear the turkey story. <laughs> Turkey Molar, written by Gabriel. The unknown is terrifying. Sometimes not knowing is better than knowing. I'm telling my story now because I received another email on Monday from Turkey Molar. I figured that I should let others know, just in case someone else receives a similar kind of email. It all began in September. I'm a sophomore in college, and in, and in September, I was getting ready to study abroad in Glasgow, Scotland. For a, sem for a semester, I was really excited to get away from the States and carve out a new life experience for myself. The night before I left, I was sending off one last email on my work account. I've been working as a research assistant on a farm run by Indiana State University, and I was emailing my supervisor some of my thoughts about an 
experimental kind of fertilizer being tested on lettuce and I told him to have a good year and I would see him next summer. I sent the email and refreshed my inbox one last time not really expecting anything and I hovered the mouse over the sign out button. But there was a new email. I expected it to be an automated message from my supervisor saying he was out of office or something, but no. It was from somebody named Turkey Molar with the address turkeymolar at gmail.com. The subject line read, Turkey Molar. Excessive? That's what I thought. a little bit surprised and confused because this was an account run by ISU that I only use for my work on the farm. I opened the email. It was a very short but strange message. It said, we are almost there. We need you. Followed by a link to an image on a website called Cherub Flip Art. Yep, it's an entire website devoted to pictures of cherubs. This particular image was of a cherub pulling an enclosed yellow wagon with a guy in a, in a green, guy in green sitting on a seat in front directing him with the reins. And there seemed to be a lot of bags and letters on top of it, like mail or something. What the hell? Someone was being stupid. I logged out and shut down. My computer and went back to packing some last minute things. I, I really just thought it was a harmless email that was supposed to be a joke, but it was weird. Well, I left for Scotland and pretty much forgot about Turkey Molar. It's fun being in a new country far away from home where the drinking age is 18 or 19. I live in an on-campus flat, and my flatmates are all pretty cool. We go out and party a lot and, and do all sorts of crazy things. You know, typical college guy stuff involving girls and tiger costumes and body shots. Classes themselves are pretty boring. I'm mostly taking science courses, but I'm also in a Scottish history class that bores me to tears. I skip most of those lectures because the professor doesn't take attendance. Last weekend, I decided to take a trip to the Isle, Isle of Skye. I thought it'd be a kind of fun to travel by myself to a place and be all cool and independent. And I always wanted to visit the Isle of Skye. So after my marine biology lecture on Friday, I left on the train to Bali, where I got on a ferry and arrived at the Isle of Skye. Man, talk about beautiful. I got in around four just when the sun was starting to go down. Yes, it was actually sunny in Scotland for once. The sky was pink and orange and made the dark jutting mountains look like a painting. It was one of the most gorgeous sights I have, I have ever beheld. Seriously, I wish I could go back and visit again. Actually, not really. I took a bus to the village of Broadford and checked into my hotel. It was nice, very clean, and very tasteful. I was staying in a three-bed mixed dorm, so I'd be sleeping with two strangers who could be male or female. Surprisingly, the beds in the dorm were really nice and comfortable and not the hard bunk beds that you usually find at a hotel. I laid down to take a short nap. I was woken up an hour later when a girl came into the dorm. Her name was Mary P. something. She was from France and she was one of my roommates for the weekend. I introduced myself and we made small talk. She was studying geography at the University of Edinburgh. She was also kind of cute. We decided to go find something to eat, and just as we were, were leaving, this huge guy came into the dorm. He wasn't fat, just really tall and built. Mary and I said hello and introduced ourselves. Hello, 
I'm Turkey Molar. The guy said, yeah. I was like, what? Did I hear you right? I completely forgotten about Turkey Molar ev ever since the night I got the email, but now here I was thinking about it again. I I'm sorry, I didn't get that, I said. Duje Miller. Oh wait. Uh, short, uh, short for Douglas. Nice to meet you. Or is that supposed to be Doogie? How is it spelled? D O U G I E. Dougie. Dougie. Okay. I'll re I'll reread that again. <laughs> All right. Doogie Miller, short for Douglas. Nice to meet you. Oh, Doogie Miller. He had a really thick Scottish accent. I have just misunderstood him, but still, the two names sound kind of alike. Doogie was from Skye himself, in a northern town called Portree. I asked Doogie why he was... He was a why he was a ho hustle here if he lived here on the island and he said sometimes he just liked to get in his car and drive away from home to get away and meet other people we all went to dinner and we got to know each other a little bit more we had a few drinks at the restaurant but doogie wanted to drink even more so he we went out to the little pub afterwards It's very local and filled with big, burly Scottish men, but it was fun, and we all had n a nice time. We were all a little drunk on the way back to the hostel. Once we got back, we decided to go th to bed early so we can get up early and use as much daylight as possible. Doogie had volunteered to bring us up north and give us a tour of the land and some of the geographical, or geographical features. I made sure to plug in my camera so it was fully juiced up for the next day, along with my iPod Touch. We all fell asleep pretty much instantly, the day's travels and alcohol taking a toll on us. The next morning, Doogie drove us up his town, Portree. He showed us around town for an hour or so, and I tried to take pictures, but my camera wasn't working. I opened it up and saw the memory card was still there, but the battery was gone. I asked Mary and Doogie about it, but they both denied do doing or knowing anything about the battery. It was very strange because the green battery light came on when I charged the camera last night, and us three were the only ones with the access to the dorm. I was pretty pissed because this was a once-in-a-lifetime trip, and I wanted to remember it. Nobody else had a camera either because Mary had her stolen in London, and Doogie didn't need one. I had my iPod touch though, so I was at least able to snap some grainy pictures. I'm still pissed about the battery. After Portree, Doogie drove us even further north to his to this really cool place called St the Store. The Store is this big rocky hill in front of it is this area called the Sanctuary, with all of these really twisted, odd-shaped rock formations. It was a really neat place, and we lucked out with another sunny day that was cool and not terribly cold. Doogie showed us his favorite place in the Sanctuary, a hollow with a small pond in the center. It was very fisher scay with the cool rock formations surrounding it and the store looming in the background behind it against a blue sky with only a few wispy clouds. We went to the water's edge and I was surprised how clear it was. You could see the rocky bottom, although I didn't see any fish. I found a really cool stick that looked like a Harry Potter wand or something. It was really smooth and curved, a foot long or so. 
I heard a splash, and there was Dookie on his back in the pond. He asked him if he was okay, and he said, yeah, he must have slipped. He got out, and it was shivering, so I got my towel from my backpack and offered it to him, which he accepted. He tried off his hand and then looped the towel around his neck, and we went on our way into the store. It was a really st steep path and kind of treacherous, with a lot of loose rocks and narrow squeezes. We stopped at a flat outcrop of rock and ate sandwiches we had brought in town. While we were eating, Doogie asked us if we wanted to see something really secret and really cool. Mary and I said sure, so after lunch he took us off the path and to the edge of the hill, which is basically a cliff. He pointed at a small hole in the ground at the base of the big rock. Down there, he said. We asked him what it was. A secret cave that no one knows about. You have to swear not to tell anyone. I examined the hole, but all I could see was some faint light. I couldn't make anything out, but I did hear something. It sounds like music, I said. Doogie said it was probably the wind. I put my ear right up to the hole and definitely sounded like music. It sounded r really far away and kind of muffled. I was mystified, but Doogie just shrugged and said we would, he would lead us down to the entrance of the cave. He brought us down a narrow ledge on the cliff face. It was actually kind of terrifying being this high off the ground with a window blowing around us on a ledge that could have been more than two feet wide. Below us were lots and lots of rocks. The view was pretty tough, and I was able to snap a few photos with my iPod. We came to a huge mass of what looked like ferns, big, gray, prehistoric-looking ferns. In here, Doogie said. We pushed through the ferns and disappeared. Are you sure this is safe? Mary asked. Doogie came back out and assured us it was, and we cautiously followed him through the ferns and entrance they hid. We were in a pretty large cave and was really long and narrow, like a tunnel and the light from the hole up above and the light from the entrance faintly illuminated it. But there was something very strange in the cave. A yellow wagon right stood right near the entrance. Somehow it looked familiar to me, but I couldn't put my finger on it. I also heard the same music I heard from above, except it was a little louder. I hear the music, Mary said. It's a Titanic song. Near, far, wherever you are, I believe... That the heart go does go on. My heart w will go on was playing, and it seemed to be coming from inside the wagon. I took a step towards the wagon, but then froze. On the cave floor in front of the wagon, with rings dangling right above them, were bones. It was actually a complete skeleton, and looked like a small human, like a child or something. Mary came over and gasped. What is this? I asked Doogie. He just shrugged and said nothing. I kneeled down to look more closely at the skeleton. I saw something even stranger. There were small, long bones protruding from both shoulders. Being a biology student, it was clear to me that they were wing bones. I had seen enough bird skeletons, but why were these here? What was this? The music? The wagon? A skeleton? Mary also commented that the bones looked like wings. Like an angel, she said. Or a baby angel, a cherub. A baby angel, a cherub, a cherub, a yellow wagon, a turkey molar. I thought back to the email and, and strained my mind to remember what the message in the email was. Sorry, sorry, real quick. Um, you are cutting in and out a lot on Discord. For fuck's sake.
Yeah, sorry. Just uh... all right. Let me start over again right here. I thought back to the email and strained my mind to remember what the message and email was. If there was, it was there in my brain, but it was just out of reach. The song ended and was quiet for like twenty seconds, and then the familiar flutes of "My Heart Will Go On" started up again. Isn't this place very interesting? Doogie said. No one else knows about it. I looked at him, and it's, he seemed so no nonchalant. I went up to the wagon to examine it. There was a little window on the side, and it was completely dark inside. I reached into my pocket for my iPod so I can use it as a flashlight, but it wasn't there. I searched my other pockets, but no iPod. I asked Mary and Doogie if they had seen it, and both of them said no. Well, I know I had it, I said angrily, because I had had it less than five minutes ago outside taking pictures. I searched my pockets again, but it wasn't anywhere to be found. Come on, I said. Who took my iPod? They both acted oblivious and earnestly protested that no, they hadn't taken my iPod. I sighed angrily and turned back to the wagon. Love can touch us one time and last for a lifetime and never let go till we're gone. I hate this song, overproduced, overplayed, and the lyrics were, are so generic. But I digress. There was a movement in the wagon. I'm not sure what it was, but I heard something move. It was a very light movement, almost like wind. Hello? I asked. Nothing, no movement. I took out my stick that I found by the pond. L Lumos? I muttered. No light. I was disappointed. I stuck the stick through the window through. Something brushed against it and moved. And the stick was gone. Something roughly jerked it from my hand into, into the wagon. What is that? I asked Doogie. He shrugged. I, I don't know. He said. Do you want to find out? I wasn't sure if I wanted to find out. I walked slowly around the wagon, inspecting it. When I reached the back, I turned and squinted into the faint light, trying to make out the rest of the cave. Once more, you open the door, and you're here in my heart. There was another skeleton. It was probably 20 or 30 feet behind the wagon. I went over to it, and yep, it was another winged child, or maybe cherub. The bones of the right wing, though, were kind of crushed. I looked out into the gloom, and there was another one, again 20 feet or so behind this one. I went over and saw the skull was split on this one, like it had been run over by the wagon. I looked up and there was another skeleton behind this one. It was like a giant trail of skeletons behind the wagon. Child skeletons. Child skeletons with wings. Cherubs. Seriously, what the hell? I went back to Doogie and Mary. Do you want to find out what's in there? Doogie repeated. I don't know. I said. I want to see. Mary said, I'll show you, Doogie said. He went up to the window. Mary following, he took a small flashlight from his pocket. Mary, are you sure? I asked. Yes, I believe so, she said, seeming a bit unsure. Why? I just don't think we should look. It's kind of like a trap. Doogie turned on the flashlight and began moving it towards the window. But it is inside. It is okay. Mary said. We will only look at it. Mary, some things you see, you can never erase from your mind. She looked at me, clearly thinking carefully about what I just said. 
I could tell she was creeped out by this as much as I was and didn't really want to see what could be in, in a wagon in a cave full of skeletons or of cherubs or winged baby or whatever the hell they are. Okay, I don't want to see, Mary said coming back to me. Why not? Yugi asked with that s with what seemed like a growl. What is it? I asked Doogie. I'm trying to let you find out, he said, his voice sounding angry. No, tell us, I said. Yours. You are safe in my heart, and my heart will go on and on. I'll show you. No, if you can't show us, you can tell us. Doogie glared at me. We are almost there, he said, pointing at the door. We need you. The email, that's what it said. We are almost there. We need you. I thought about this whole situation, how creepy it was. Need us for what? I asked. The song stopped playing. Doogie just stared at us, saying nothing. Wanna go, Mary? I asked. Yes, she said. Come on, Doogie, let's go. He continued to stare at us for a few moments and then relented. If you're so eager, sure. He said unkindly. Mary and I went out of the cave and he stormed out after us. As we were leaving, I heard the song start again. Doogie didn't say anything on the hike back to his car. I was kind of scared of him, partly because he was a huge guy and could do anything to us, and partly because of what just happened. But we were in the middle of nowhere and needed the ride back to town, and it was getting dark. We drove dangerously fast on the way back to Portree, but I was too afraid to ask him to slow down. He dropped us off at a square in the middle of town. I remember what that I had given him my towel. I asked if I could have it back. I don't have it, he said, and I didn't see it anywhere in the car. I had no idea where it was. I must have left it back at the store. Doogie gave us one last dirty look and then turned around and drove off in the direction from where we came. Mary and I looked at each other. That had been that had been a really weird experience. We were able to get a bus back to Broadford in our in our hostel. Doogie had checked out that morning, and we had a new roommate for that night. This quiet guy named James, who didn't say anything to us besides the name, but that was fine with me. The next morning, Sunday, last Sunday, I got up early and left taking a bus across a bridge back to Glasgow. Mary was staying two more days, and we said our goodbyes. She said she still was still kind of freaked out about the day before, but she would try to forget it. She said she wasn't going to tell anyone because she didn't think anybody else should be exposed to that. I agree with her. She told me she would add me on Facebook, but so far, I haven't heard anything from her. Maybe I'll never will. Maybe it's for it's the best to forget as much as I can about the experience. So here I am, back in my flat at the University of Glasgow, mystified and trying to make sense of what happened in that cave. What was in that cave? Oh, and there's a, a coda to my story. On Monday, while I was thinking about what happened, I decided to check my work email to see if any new messages. I hadn't checked it since the night before I left for Scotland, and I had two messages. One was was from way back in September for my supervisor telling me to have a good year, and the other one was sent only two hours ago from Turkey Molar. The subject once again read, Turkey Molar. I debated for like five minutes if I should open the email or not. My curiosity got the best of me. 
I opened it. Retry soon. And a link to a YouTube video. That was all the message contained. I clicked on the link. It was a YouTube video, so it couldn't be a virus or anything too weird. But it is weird. It's only 30 seconds long, and it shows a guy or something in a black coat with a green towel over its head. And yes, my lost towel is green. The guy, yeah, I'm just going to call it a human and hope it's a human. Stands there for like 10 seconds just looking at the camera. And in its hands, well, in one hand he's holding a stick. My stick. The one that whatever was in the wagon jerked from my hand. The, and the guy's other hand is something that's too small for me to make out. Maybe somebody has some kind of software or something that can zoom in and figure out what it is. I'm not really technologically advanced like that. And he collapses. That's the entire video. The guy enters, stand there with a towel covering his, his head, holding my stick and a small unknown object in his hands, and then collapses. Oh, and you can faintly hear my heart will go on in the background. The guy in the video can't be Doogie. This guy was way too small and slender. Doogie's like 6 foot 5 or something and at least 230 pounds or more. But I have no idea who it could be. Also, I took several videos from my iPod Touch when I had it. I'm still angry so I'll install it in my camera battery. The video is framed just like an iPod video. And the quality isn't very good. Like it was filmed on an iPod. So yeah, I don't know what any of this means, and I haven't shared it with anyone, but now I am. I need to get this out there so if something ha happens, other people know. I have a theory about what I saw in the cave. The YouTube user who uploaded the video is, of course, Turkey Malar. And this is the, on the only video he, she, it has uploaded. In the description is the link to the cherub picture. And here's my theory about the cherubs. A cherub is basically a toddler with wings. A toddler would only be able to drag a big wagon like the one in the cave about 20 feet. In my estimation, before collapsing of exhaustion or dying, the wagon was near the entrance of the cave, 20 more feet, and it would be outside. We are almost there. We need you. What would happen once the wagon was outside? It would fall off the cliff and be dashed on the rocks below, and whatever was inside could get out. If we had seen what Doogie wanted to show us, would we have become cherubs? Would we have been forced to pull the wagon? I have no idea. It's just a theory. I can't even begin to hypothesize about what was in the wagon. I only know whatever it is. It has to have been in there for a long time. And I don't think it's a coincidence that Doogie Miller, pronounced in a thick Scottish accent, sounds like Turkey Molar. I really hope that he fails in carrying out his master's orders. I really hope he isn't able to show somebody else what's in the wagon. Because what's ever in there, I don't think it'll be good for us. I really don't think it would. And that's it. Thanks, I hate it. You hate the story? No, no. It's like saying the ending. Uh. It's a good ending. It's just, thanks, I hate it. <laughs> it's hard to describe. Oh, you That's it, that I liked the story, I liked the ending, but also thinks I hate it. Uh, I was simply going to say, I've come to the conclusion that if I want to get a good understanding of the stories, I'm just going to have to watch the podcast or the VOD at some point, because I keep hyperfixating on Twitter. <laughs> Oh my god, <laughs> I'm sorry. 
I like feeling like I have. What are you doing to... on Twitter? Mostly scrolling, and I started attempting to have a philosophical conversation about spirituality with someone. Yeah, anyways, I'm gonna put it in intermission real quick, because I have to go to the bathroom. Okay. Yeah, I'm just fixating on the board, which probably isn't the best for me, but it's been what's happening. But I, I do appreciate the feeling of being in a room with people. It's helping me, so I'm still having a good time. Uh... It's kind of like, uh, it's kind of like the live version of when uh, you put on a podcast in the background while you're doing work and barely pick up on anything in the podcast. Or something along those lines. Fair enough. Also, I will be right back. I think that might be a very big spider that needs rescuing. Good luck saving the nice spider, baby. Yeah, this scooter is about the size of the end of my thumb. I'm gonna go release them somewhere where they won't get eaten by cats. Shall be back. Good luck. Spiders may not really bite people, but they are very good at moving. Probably because they have eight fucking legs. I'd probably be that good at moving if I had eight damn legs. Oh, you want to catch me? No, I've got eight fucking legs. downstairs to get coffee. Was this your plan to get me to get off the house? Oh. Well, this looks delicious. I probably can't really go anywhere until at least one person comes back. I have no way to tell them I want to see, so I should. 
the scooter has been released under the deck because it's raining. That is valid. And now, because you are back, people can continue to in for us. What did you say? I said that is fair point, and then I said I will be back. I'm going to get coffee for the pumpkin roll cake slice food has brought me. Okay. I'll be right back. Okay, I guess I look like a fucking idiot.
I'm back. God's my You good? Might be heard. Yeah. Was that heard? Uh, I heard. Uh, was that heard? Uh, my computer is being slow. Ah, that's what I. And I think Jerry headed off to get something. To distracted with uh, Twitter. Cause basically, I explained this to Jerry. I'm, I'm still appreciating what's going on here. Because if I'm not paying that much attention to the story, mm -hmm. so good. Oh. I heard something from Jerry. I'm just going to probably just start the next story. Alright. If that's alright for everyone that's still here. Yeah, I'm, I'm good with that. Alright. Alright. But it I mean, we could probably. What? Waiting for Jerry. What was that? Did any of that? I was saying we could probably wait, like try waiting. How long ago did they leave? Because sometimes they take really long to come back. Well, maybe five or so minutes. I guess we're gonna put it back at intermission. I mean, it's whatever you want to do. I just know that uh, Jerry might not like us moving on without. still here. Everything. Books. Ah, uh, I see. Just enjoying.
ten. Eight. Another five. someone on Twitter they they oh my god alright I don't even know what how to even put this into words I'm just gonna send it to book, a book on and do hatch it I don't even know how to put that into words what I'm witnessing. <laughs> still being heard. Yeah, I hear you. Okay. Just checking out. I think I need to just stop using Twitter so that my computer will stop slow. Mm -hmm. So I'm noticing it's specifically slowing down whenever I open up like You, I couldn't put it into words.
Not that. Oh God, what the? F no. <laughs> Hiding up. Should you say something? You're getting cut out. Uh, fucking computer. Hello, Hatchet. Am I being heard? Yes. Okay. Oh, I hear sounds. I'm back. The gay lord has returned. Gay lord? Yes. Okay. As Bright has set in motion in the server, you are the lord of the game. Yes, Bright has said that she has, yes. And you do have the gay lord role. Thank you, Bright. I think it's actually lowered in the trial mod. Uh, uh, the, the mod thing. I don't think I made it higher than mod, which means well, Jerry could remove it at any fucking time. Wait, I can? Yes! No! No! Bright! What have you done? But the thing is, I, I can just add it back. Yeah, and this time make it so that it's above mod. <laughs> I mean, it's still there. What is the point of appointing a gay lord if the gay lord can stop being a gay This is so stupid. Well, you wouldn't know if I remove it or not anyway. I mean, I can just look through your rolls. God damn it. And, and I mean, yeah, come to think of it, like, it, it's aura is still there. You still have the title, even if it's not there in this Hey! I will make the rules. I did nothing. <clears throat> you re added it, only if. I can't remove it. <laughs> okay. I put it right you cannot above escape librarians. The role. I put it right above librarians, which means you can't <laughs> remove it. <laughs> okay. Accept your role as gay lord, Jerry. Okay, I'm the gay lord of the third world. <sighs> Anyways. Was that hard? No. I may 
be a grumpy person that isn't the youngest person here, but I do, I do, uh, I do, uh, I don't know. Anyway, we're, are you ready to go back? Reading stories? Mm. Yeah. Three, two, one. All right. Or tell you what, Jerry. Tell you what, Jerry. We we will consider naming you something other than the Gay Lord. Whenever there has been sufficient proof that you are no longer actively collecting hunts. <laughs> I'm not actively collecting hunts. <laughs> then why do they keep showing up? <laughs> what do you mean? They're not like going through the server. Well, yeah, yes. but I mean, just you—you you keep having more Huns. I don't keep having more Huns. Food. Food. Mm. Can you tell them that I'm not collecting Huns anymore? Well, I mean, food. The future is not set in stone. <laughs> food. I mean. You you have to know by now that trying to win one of these dumb debates by appealing to Spood is not going to work in your favor. Yeah. Spood's my sibling. Spood's yes, and my your sibling, sibling is just yes, and your sibling is just like us in the sense of wanting to playfully tease you because it's fun. Oh yeah. Or you might have twenty more. I don't know. I'm not good. Food. Yeah. I wouldn't even be able to remember their names. I mean, if they wore name tags or something. <laughs> what? <laughs> anyway, hello, think yes. This would work. Hello, yes. You have to wear a name tag. Hello, yes. You are Hun number 374. Oh my god. Jerry, hold on. Here's how you can. Here's how you, I can solve that issue for you. Have all the new 20 boyfriends. Be named Brad. <laughs> so you have Brad no! one, Brad two. No! <laughs> Just be dating twenty Brads at once. Also, first while I think Brad is a fine name, I'd never date a guy named. Fair. Anyways, oh. be ready to actually start the fucking horror. Yeah. Or would it be Chad? <laughs> Oh, anyway, anyway, Tom needs to have a different name. <laughs> Jormungandr. They're all your named Jormungandr. Wow, that's a mouthful. <laughs> my Huns are none of my Huns are named Jormungandr. <laughs> Yet. <laughs> I don't know. Have to check their genealogy to see if they aren't half Jotun. <laughs> Nobody is half. I don't know. It, it, it may, may, maybe they maybe they are actually Jormungandr, just in disguise. Uh, anyways, <laughs> this is really stupid. Yeah, yeah, let's continue. Anyway, it's getting late. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> this is the first chapter. Uh, the horrors of the back rooms, written by Mister Mills Forty Five. I moved into my my current house with my parents three years ago in 2006. Seems so long ago now that the number is in front of me, but you're not here to listen to me reminisce about times that have since passed. So I'll try my best to get right to the point without adding too much unnecessary fluff. My name is Alex. I'm 15 years old, and I've been trying to convince my parents that something is seriously wrong with our house. You see, the first few years here were fine. Nothing out of the ordinary. I had actually loved the place. My bedroom here was much bigger than the one at the old house, providing a lot more space for my gaming setup. But recently, within the last couple of months, found something in our basement that is not entirely sure it's actually as real as I think it is. Maybe I really am going crazy. Probably why my parents won't even bother to find out about what I'm talking about. Good one, they tell me. You're being paranoid. I 
figured that if they weren't going to take my word for it, then I was going to need to present them with some hard evidence of it. For both of them and anyone else who can do something about this, if they can do something about this. Luckily enough, my parents had purchased me a camcorder for my 14th birthday. I expressed some interest. I expressed some interest in film and video production. Up to this point, I had used it to create some amateur movies with friends from school, which were mainly just short clips of us walking through the woods, attempting to look frightening. Nonetheless, it being summer vacation helped me to be able to do this undisturbed. They more likely assumed I'd be doing nothing but sitting in my room playing video games anyway. Not that I blame them in all honesty. Once I knew my parents had both left for work in the morning, I sprung up out of bed and grabbed my camcorder, not even realizing that I hadn't taken the time to get dressed first. So I merely slipped on a t-shirt along with my pajama pants and socks before beginning to head downstairs. I made sure to give every room above the basement a quick look through in order to make sure that I was the only one in the house at the time. After which, I stood at the basement door, putting my hand on the knob and taking a deep breath. It wasn't that I was having second thoughts necessarily, but I considered things that could potentially go wrong before ultimately deciding the risk was worth it to prove my claims. So I opened the door and took my first steps down the creaky stairs. Reaching over to my right and hitting the switch to turn the basement light on. Our basement itself wasn't something to write home about. It was what you usually expect. A cold brown painted concrete floor and a wall rectangular expanse with wood supports and insulin lining the ceiling. Old dusty washing machines, piles of both dirty and freshly cleaned clothes, and an assortment of different baskets, cobwebs lining every corner of the room with centipedes worming their way underneath the cracks on the walls. I made it to the bottom of the stairs before taking a left and heading into the more recreational side of the basement, although the only thing that truly made it recreational was a simple lawn chair and an old coffee table, one that I'm sure had been used in the past several months. Nonetheless, I soon made it to, to the thing I was talking about. The wall that was opposite the lawn chair and coffee table. Call me crazy because in a minute I'm sure you're going to be asking, what could be so wrong with a simple wall? Well, this wall, it was slightly darker than the rest. Even those immediately to both its right and left, it had the shadow that was eternally cast onto it. Even when there wasn't a lighter source or object to create one. And sometimes it flickered, as if it were a light bulb. I've seen it happen before and I saw it taking place yet again right before my eyes. The first few times it happened I could have sworn it was just my imagination, but now it was clear that my imagination had nothing to do with it. I thought that was the most strange part of this whole ordeal. I had come down to look at it before and I thought the out of ordinary phenomenon would end there until I got the balls to touch it. I mainly wanted to see if there's something that I was missing, that maybe it had something to do with the, with the paint, or or I just had something really wrong with my eyes. But that was just me trying to rationalize something I didn't understand. Because yesterday, I grabbed my broomstick and shoved it right up against the wall, expecting some paint to chip or some material to crumble. But no, instead, the broomstick simply went sh through the wall. I'm not really sure how to describe it in an intellectual or detailed manner. It is as simple and absurd as it sounds. My boomstick went through a solid concrete wall. I even walked forward with it in my hands at the time and it continued going deeper in the wall, feeling no obstacles or objects stopping it. To make it clear, there were no holes, no cracks or breaches large enough to fit the width of the broomstick within. It was flat and smooth, and yet the broomstick sunk further in 
as if for lodged in quicksand. And then, after some careful, but clearly not enough, consideration, I put my hand up to the wall and once my elbow dis disappeared, I pulled back. There was no pain, no extreme temperatures, no bugs, someone or something waiting to grab, bite, or claw me. It was just shocking, in a way that made me want, made me only want to learn more. Maybe I just never noticed it before, but I could have sworn the wall had looked much more normal when we first moved in. Not that I ever spent very much time in the basement. Maybe I had no idea what I was talking about. Maybe I just hadn't truly paid attention enough to notice any changes. But last time, it was only my arm. This time, I was going to put my entire entirety of my body inside. I wanted to step through to see what was on the other side of this wall. There was a part of me that even considered this to be some sort of hologram projection. And it somehow was less insane than what it actually ended up being. But nonetheless, I always look back and see this as one of, of my most ill-informed acts. But the curiosity in me simply couldn't be contained. I needed answers. So with my camcorder still in hand, I approached the wall, reaching out my hand yet again to make sure it was still passing through. And as you can infer, the result was rather unsurprising. So after I took a deep breath and looked behind my shoulder at the rest of my basement, I stepped forward slowly, my natural instinct telling me the wall was still solid despite me vanishing further into it. But suddenly, I felt like I was being jerked forward and falling. The actual feeling of falling only lasted for less than half a second before I hit solid ground again with a thud. My camcorder fell on my hand as I collided with what I assumed was another floor or wall. The mixture under me felt rugged, like a carpet with a bit of moisture. I rubbed my head and opened my eyes, thinking I had fallen into a section of our house that, that I wasn't supposed to discover. But no, that wasn't it at all. What I saw when I looked up didn't make any sense. It didn't even seem possible. Part of me had wondered if I had accidentally inhaled a hallucinogen or something. In front of me was what I could only describe as a large, messily segmented and built set of rooms, hallways, and corridors. All the walls were covered in this truly awful, bright yellow wallpaper that looked as if a small child had picked it out. It wasn't easy on the eyes in the slightest. I got myself to my feet, looking over to my right and seeing my camcorder on the ground, not broken and still recording. I leaned over and picked it up, putting it back in my hand before immediately turning around to get a better bearing on my surroundings. How did I get here? Why was I here? What was this place? There were a million thoughts running through my head, and even though it was the last thing I wanted to do, I remained calm. That's what you always do in situations like this. You must remain calm. Panicking helps nothing and no one. It was quiet for the most part in this strange place, the only sound being a slight electric buzzing noise. It had an irritating hum to it, and I couldn't help but look up to find the origin of it, seeing a white tiled ceiling with a poorly placed fluorescent lights running along it, most of which processed a subtle flicker. Hello? I called out. Is anyone there? No response, so I ran up one of the walls and started pushing on it. The moist carpet squilched a bit beneath my feet as I heaved myself forward in an attempt to pass through the wall as I had earlier to no avail. I turned and dashed over to the wall behind me, pushing and shoving myself up against it, but it, like the other, was solid. I backed away from the wall, coming to the conclusion that I needed to save my energy if I was going to get out of here anytime soon. And while I imagine many ways this could get worse, it didn't make it any easier to accept the fact that I was trapped, trapped in this almost otherworldly sub-basement. 
so I started by wandering down the nearest corridor to my left. It seemed to be around 200 feet long, with dozens of, in of intersecting halls connecting to it on both the right and left walls. The same horrendous yellow wallpaper was consistent throughout. Even the humming and buzzing of the lights above followed me as I walked down the hallway. The fact that it was the only noise present in this building besides the squelching of, of moist carpet as I walked only further drove me up the wall. It was maddening, in the most mundane and yet most unsettling way possible. It's crazy how much humans rely on sound for comfort. Because I had only been in the string expanse for about a minute, and it had already felt like hours. Hello? I yelled once again, hoping for even a semblance of a response. Is anyone here? Can you hear me? Like the previous attempt, there was nothing in response. Not a sound or a sign of another human being. My breathing practically became twice as loud to make up for the dreadful silence. I soon encountered the end of the narrow corridor. I, won I wandered into what appeared to be a much larger rectangular expanse. Basic design and layout were still the same, with multiple other corridors converging in the middle, kind of like an intersection. The lights flickered more heavily in the middle of the intersection, the humming and buzzing becoming almost unbearable. I don't know who approved the funding for this place, but they must have been out of their goddamn minds. I hadn't quite been able to come to a decision about which direction I should have gone at the intersection. All I know is that I wanted to get as far away as possible from the dang buzzing. I scooped out each hallway from where I stood with my eyes with the one on the left catching my attention the most, not because I was genuinely curious, but because it actually had something distinct going for it. By distinct, I mean that it was dimmer than the other three, with o only one of the fluorescent lights in the entire visible length of it, but despite its poor lighting, I noticed something about halfway down its length. On the ground was what looked to be a piece of paper laid out on the ground, just a single sheet that contained text on it, written in red ink. Being the only distinguishable proof of life or the presence of other human beings in this place, I began to creep down the corridor and approach it, looking back over my shoulder with the undeniable feeling of being watched as I did so. I reached down picking up the note as I made it o over, only to make the unnerving discovery that the red ink wasn't ink at all. It was blood. I don't know how long I've been here, or how much longer I've got left. I'm scared. It feels like it's been days and I've been able to find a way out. All I did was come home after work, throw myself into bed, and then I was here. I found this paper laying around in here, along with someone's car keys that were laying around have blood on them. I haven't seen another person since I got here, but I'm not alone here. There's something else lurking in, in these walls, and it isn't a man or a, it isn't any man or woman. I've got to keep quiet, stay low, and whatever got to the guy who, who's, who these keys belong to will come for me as well. To whoever finds this, if anyone finds this, keep quiet, stay low, and God help you if that thing hears you. I felt my heart s I felt my heart sink into my stomach as I turned to look behind me only to find nothing but the slight flickering of the lights yet again. But I was more than on edge. As crazy as it sounded, I believed every word that was written here. This wasn't some practical joke or prank. Even the most elaborate pranksters didn't have the resources or something like this. I can't count the number of times I've seen a horror movie where something that's obviously not a joke is treated like one like one by the protagonist and guess what they end up dead there was no name or, or other information on the note and since I was made aware that there might be something bloodthirsty lurking in here with me the last thing I need to do was carry around this note and the smell of blood on me 
so I left it, dropping it right at my feet and began heading further down the corridor into a cylinder-shaped room. It was still more of the same as far as design and architecture went. I took another deep breath, preparing to head down the right corridor of the cylinder room. Before I could even move an inch, I heard a sound that made my blood freeze. The rest of me stayed right where I was by extension. The sound in question was loud, ear-shattering screech that didn't sound all that far from behind me. I stood there completely terrified while my previous confidence quickly drained. I could only hope I wasn't seen by whatever it was. And I wasn't. Not yet, anyway. Once I mustered up the courage to finally turn around, I didn't see anything behind me. It was still the same yellow walls and moist carpet, and yet it had somehow become even more sinister than, than before. And that thing, was it what killed the person who wrote the note? Whatever this being was, I could now hear it getting closer. Its footsteps were quicker and frantic, so I picked up the pace a bit. My slow march turned into a brisk stroll. I couldn't help but feel like my heart was going to explode out of my chest from the dread the situation filled me with. I made a left turn and then another before booking it down a wide corridor before making a right. This place really was a nonsensical maze. The architecture made absolutely no sense, but I refused to let this yellow wasteland become my grave. The creature shrieked again, but this time the tone was slightly changed. Now sounding a bit more celebratory, more triumphant, as if it had accomplished something that it had extracted joy from. It was only once I heard what came next that I understand why. No, 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 no! Came the desperate, horrifying screams of what sounded like an adult man who knew he was about to meet a truly awful fate. I couldn't pinpoint exactly which hallway or room the chaos was coming from. All I know is that it wasn't more than 30 or 40 feet away. Regardless, I wasn't intending to play hero against some creature I hadn't, I hadn't even seen the appearance of. Stop! Stop! No! The man began to cry out, only to be cut off by his own shriek, accompanied by the sound of bones snapping and flesh tearing. His cries soon became gurgled, only lasting a few more seconds before he was drowned out by the sound of aggressive snarling and growling. At this point, I was sprinting, tears in both stress and fear forming in my eyes. I quickly raised my fingers up in order to wipe them away and keep them from blurring my vision as I ran. I eventually found a tight, almost closet-sized space at the end of one of the hallways. I didn't hesitate to slip inside and get myself out of sight as soon as humanly possible. Once in, I headed to the corner furthest from the opening, sat down, put my knees to my chest before shoving my face in my arms and taking surprising care to not be too loud, lest I want to draw that thing over and then really have something to cry about. I can only think about how I really might die here, that I'll be the next victim of whatever that monster is. If there were more people that were alive and trapped in this, whatever this place is, then I have to try and find them make a plan to get out of here once and for all. I let myself stare into the darkness of this crevice as I sat there with the illusion of safety while still in more terror than ever. I only just now realized I dropped my camcorder and all of the chaos of my reacting and running, but most of me honestly didn't care. Proving a point wasn't worth it at the moment I fell into this place. I should have left the wall alone. I should have just minded my own damn business and not poked my nose where it should have been. As helpless as I felt, I know my idiotic action, actions had a part to play in this predicament I found myself in. But I was here now, and I had to grapple with the reality of less intelligent moves I've made. If I was going to get out of here alive, the last thing I needed to do was sit here and mentally check out. I needed to be on my toes and alert. So once I muttered the strength to stand back up, I did just that. I was still no superhero or brave soldier, but I was someone who wanted to survive. Someone who wanted to live 
to share a story I'm sure most would not believe. I quietly walked over to where I had entered a small den, turning to peek my head through the skinny opening into the larger hallway. But I immediately froze when I heard footsteps, footsteps that weren't heavy or slow, but abundantly and quick, but abundant and quick, as if whatever was moving was moving on far more than just two limbs. They were coming from down the corridor to my left. I could make out the fact that whatever it was, it was going to turn the corner any second. I retreated back into the den and got as far away from the opening as, a, as was physically possible. But more of a curiosity as whatever I was trapped in space with couldn't be contained. It just brutally killed someone. So any sort of negotiating or attempting to reason with it was out of the question. All I could do was sit there and wait as it began to walk down the hallway, approaching closer and closer to the den. Once again, its footsteps were soft yet horrendously abundant. It sounded like more like scurrying. It had this almost tapping-like rhythm that made my skin crawl, like a spider and like a spider the size of a dog running down a hallway. I held my breath as it approached, only letting myself exhale when absolutely necessary. I didn't dare poke my head out of the entrance or attempt to get a direct look at it. But the shape of a shadow on the wall behind the den opening did more than enough to make sure I never forgot this experience for the rest of my life. The lowest part of his body looked to be composed of at least a dozen thin but long limbs that all moved in unison with one another in a twisted, uncanny manner, like a centipede that had been softly stitched together. Both that had, both that set of horrific legs was a long rectangular frame with dozens more bent and thin limbs protruding from each side of it. I couldn't even tell this, if this thing had a head definitely not one that I could make out with the shadow. Who in her right mind would keep a, a monstrosity like this in here? Was it locked up? Did it kill pe the people keeping it contained and get out? Is that why this place is abandoned? Even if, if I did have answers to all those questions, it still doesn't explain the fact that it seems like I'm far from the only average person to end up trapped in here. It really was something out of the child's nightmare, anyone's nightmare in all honesty. It stopped only feet in front of the entrance of my, to my den, prayed to every god that it could think of, hoping it wouldn't detect or sense me. The creature, whatever it was, let out a low growl, a far departure from the pitch of sounds it was making previously. I could feel it vibrate the wall that, that my back was against as I held my breath. Even if I wanted to make a sound, I couldn't. No noise could, could escape me. My terror was busy holding it in. I seemed to turn side to side as if in the middle of looking for something, but the creature couldn't move in either of those directions, instead choosing to continue to move forward and turn the corner down another hall, allowing me to live to see another day for the time being. I needed to escape while I had a chance busting out the entrance to the den and immediately making a mad dash for the left and the lightest footsteps possible. Nearly right after turning the corner, I spotted my camcorder on the floor at the far end of the hall. It had been smashed with dozens of broken off pieces all over the area surrounding it. All footage and proof I had were gone. I wasn't aware at the time if there was some way to extract or salvage anything off of it. I can only wonder how pissed my friends would be when I tell them that all of those short films we created using that thing were to are toast. But there wasn't much time to mourn the loss of my, of my hard work, so I kept moving. When I made it back to the cylinder room this time, I chose a different path to go down. The last thing I need needed was to go anywhere besides the total opposite direction of where that thing was headed. I was now more alert than ever as I trekked through the nonsensical expanse aware that there was far worse waiting for me in these halls than simple starvation or severe loneliness as a result of isolation. In all honesty, I've always been 
love my privacy and being away from others, but not like this. There was more of the same everywhere I went. Yellow walls, white ceiling, and smelly moist carpet. The hum buzz of lights became a background song at a certain point. I had just accepted the reality that it wasn't going to stop anytime soon. Regardless, I took three left turns and three right ones before heading straight for what I felt like nearly a quarter of a mile and taking another left. I thought that I was surely leaving the creature in the dust, that it would never find me in this endless